What we are experiencing in this world, the truth of it, is so much stranger than any fiction story than you could ever, ever imagine. Your reality and our reality is this beautiful geometric scope of experience. The degree that you can recognize through pattern recognition, you are uplifting your consciousness and your ability to perceive higher dimension. That introduces this concept of who created it. The pyramids are housing these keys of information that were built into it so that humanity, when it awakens, will be able to crawl out of the ashes of that duality. Man only suffers because he takes seriously what the gods created for fun. When you realize that you've been in the dream that is this world, you can now play in it. If you knew that death wasn't real, would you change the things you do in this life? To achieve a complete mind, study the art of science, study the science of art, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind and open heart to allow us to deepen our sense of knowing ourselves. And my guest today is a brilliant individual with an open heart indeed. If you listen to this podcast, Know Thyself, you are here to learn more about the true nature of yourself, to walk in alignment with truth, and to become the most authentically expressed version of yourself. And my guest today is an entrepreneur. He is an author. He is a modern day polymath and somebody who's integrating his innovations across across math, science, and the arts to bring well-being to humanity. He is somebody I feel that is on a, he's like a modern day Indiana Jones on a spiritual scavenger hunt to decode cosmic mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm really looking forward to diving into all the avenues that we're going to dive into today. So Robert Edward Grant, thank you for coming on the show. Thank bro. you. So good to be here with you, Andre. Yeah, so good, man. Um, I love to just dive deep right off the bat. Cool. So, <laughs> um, you know, I've been diving deep into your work and, you know, a fan for a while. And it's really beautiful to see uh, the coherence that you bring to many different fields, right? And that is kind of what a polymath does and is. And my first question is, as you study the intelligence of nature and across the different fields of math and science and art, how do you feel like the geometry of nature is helping us know ourselves deeper and deeper? Interesting. Well, I can only speak to my own personal yeah. journey on this. I think it impacts people differently um, because we all have our own window of perception and we can't separate our lens of perception with our reality, right? So I can speak to my particular experience and my particular experience was I went through a very difficult time in 2016 where I had to reconcile betrayal. And you don't ever feel betrayed by somebody that you didn't care about. You only feel betrayed by people that you really cared about. And so there gets to be this massive gap between expectation and what your reality that you experienced was. And instead of um, blaming others, which I probably would have done at you know, earlier stages in my life, I decided to look within and ask myself, you know, maybe my perception on my reality is not exactly as it truly is. Maybe I'm seeing the world as I am rather than as it is. And in order to reconcile these things, I had to go and reconstruct my entire objective reality. So the reconstruction process uh, included a deep dive into mathematics, the queen of the sciences, the most objective, right? If you talk to anybody, the nice thing about math is math is just math, and you can't, math doesn't lie, right? Um, but at the same time, mathematics is very esoteric. So we have numerology and we have astrology, which is another branch, you could argue, of mathematics as well. And it's all related to frequency. And the entire universe is based on frequency. And then you start thinking about, well, wait a minute, geometry and music are related too. And maybe music is just the geometry that we experience with our ears. And maybe geometry is just the music that we experience with our eyes. And so, I got a very personal relationship and a deep dive spiritual relationship when I went through that process to recognize that everything is connected. You know, Leonardo da Vinci famously said, um, to achieve a complete mind, study the art of science, study the science of art, learn how to see, realize that everything connects 
to everything else. And when I kind of heard that for the first time, I started really recognizing, I think, what he really meant by that, which is that your reality and our reality is this beautiful geometric scope of experience. And that scope of experience can span across what we refer to as geometry and what we refer to as music and what we refer to as light and what we refer to as sound and what we refer to as matter and what we refer to as, as the, the geometry of space-time. All of it, biology, chemistry, is all connected. You know, I can make an argument that says that mathematics in its applied form is geometry. So therefore, applied geometry is physics. Applied physics would then just be chemistry. And applied chemistry would be biology. And applied biology would be psychology. And applied psychology would be sociology. And applied sociology would be philosophy. And applied philosophy comes back to mathematics. So it's this total connection across all of these seemingly disparate disciplines in our life experience that leads us to recognize that, wait a minute, it's not all separate at all. It's all one. And that geometry in all of its different manifestations and forms across all those different disciplines and specialties is turning us back to recognize the oneness of the universe. And then that introduces the concept of who created it. <laughs> because the thing that with geometry, when I started getting into it, and there's something beautiful you have on your wall just outside Metatron's cube, right? And most people probably don't know unless they're into geometry what the significance of Metatron's cube is. Do you know what the significance of it is? Um, it's the, well, the interconnectedness between the flower of life and mm -hmm. um, like the meaning behind Metatron's cube. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your explanation. Yeah, I figured you might, might want to hear it. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. Most people make that connection you just said, right. which is absolutely correct. Flower of life and Metatron's cube are definitely one and the same thing. You could say that. You're just taking a few of the circles away yeah. and just making sure that the circles that stay are the ones that are next to each other, mm -hmm. right? And so there's none of the overlapping circles that you have of a flower of yeah. life. But then you connect all of the center points of those circles and it creates Metatron's cube. Right. But a lot of people don't realize that you can form literally out of that one structure all of the platonic solids. Not only all the platonic solids, but all of the Archimedean solids by making another form of Metatron's cube, just offsetting it by 15 degrees, and then having a 12-point perspective, you can have all of the Archimedean, all the Catalan solids. Virtually every single geometric form that exists in the universe can be made in its regular form out of that one structure of Metatron's cube. So all creation comes from this. And this is one of the things that I did. I took a 24-point perspective. So if you took four Metatron's cubes, right? So you've got six points on each one that form this hex hexagonal form. If you do that in rotation so that you've got a 24-point, so you're just multiplying mm -hmm. six by four, mm -hmm. so you're creating four-point perspective against the six points, and you connect all the lines of that, it looks like an entirely mess, like a gigantic mess of entropic lines that you could... It gets really confusing because you're like, what the heck am I looking at? But if you can put your consciousness into those lines, the complexity of all those lines, you might be able to see the shape of a square. You might also see the shape of a triangle. And most people can. You might see the shape of a pentagon because it's all in there. You might also see the shape of a hexagon or you know, all of the other potential shapes that could exist in polygonal form. But can you also then see a tetrahedron? which is a three-dimensional version of a triangle, mm -hmm. one way to easily say this. Can you see a cube? Can you see a dodecahedron? Can you see an icosahedron? Can you see a cuboctahedron? Can you see a rhombocuboctahedron? Can you see uh, a Durer solid? Can you see all of the different shapes that are there? And the degree that you can recognize through pattern recognition and then bold those lines, you are uplifting your consciousness and your ability to perceive higher dimension. So the more geometric forms you can recognize and track by looking in this mess of lines that looks totally entropic and it makes no sense whatsoever, and then bold those, to me, I call that a higher form of consciousness quotient. Hmm. So the more of those lines you can recognize, you're pushing the boundary condition of entropy, which is really just ignorance, further and further away from you as you understand more of this divine encryption that is the universe that we live in. 
Wow. <laughs> that you was wanted to a, go deep, right? I wanted to go deep, and, and we're going deep. <laughs> Beautiful. And I mean, I definitely didn't know to the depth in which, for example, the Metatron's Cube had... So it's all depth. creation. Yeah, but I feel that, right? Like, And I think that we can, especially in deep meditation, deep stillness, expansive experiences, maybe a psychedelic journey, you can feel the inner, inherent interconnect in nature of of nature and geometry and you spoke to a lot of things that i want to open up which is one we do have a very limited bandwidth of perception right and if math is a language of the universe but as we grow and we expand our consciousness we see how all the fields of chemistry alchemy sound music physics they're all different fractals of the same kind of source of divination and come Mm -hmm. from the same source Mm -hmm. And so for your study, like you've been able to put together a lot of how they're really one and the same, right? How they're all in one Mm -hmm. and one and all. So my question is, how does the pattern recognition of seeing how all of these are all interconnected, how does that allow us to know ourselves deeper, develop more self-mastery, or just understand the world at deeper and deeper levels? Because we can have the felt experience of our interconnected reality. But then to be able to articulate it in the way you are and purvey how in waking sober consciousness that you can see everything is kind of coming from the same source and they are all informing one another. Um, just, just take it from there if there's anything that comes Here's up from that. Here's the beauty of it. When you get to the stage where you realize that everything emanates from just the number one and then you start thinking, okay, so I'm experiencing this oneness all around me and all of its different manifestations that are all geometric at their base. So who is the number one? And then you realize that you are. You're the number one. You are the one experiencing itself all around you. And then you realize that you you have a unique identifier. You have your own signature, your own number per se. And then the universe around you is just one over that number. So in particle physics and in quantum physics, so there's a fellow by the name of Niels Bohr. You may have heard of him, the Bohr atom model. So he was in the Solvang conference with Einstein back in 1933. And and they were like friends, but also argued a lot, right? So he was more on the quantum physics side and Einstein would be more on the standard model side. You could say that. And, And a lot of Einstein's teachings, even though his mentor was predominantly a fellow by the name of Max Planck, who was a quantum physicist as well, who famously said, there is no matter as such. There's only a conscious mind at the basis of all of our universal experience. So going back to Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr unfortunately did not get the same degree of notoriety as Einstein. And why? Well, he happened to be Germanic at a time when we were going into World War II. And I think that that indelibly had an impact on how the world perceived his work, no matter how you look at it. But one of the things he did come up with and and was recognized for was something called the Bohr atom model, which basically says that we have hydrogen and we can predict exactly the spectral lines of hydrogen based on its frequency and one over its frequency. And he defined that as one over lambda and lambda. And the, the spectral lines of emission could be determined and accurately so. So there's specific spectral lines of light, you know, different nanometers or angstroms in measurement of light that would be emitted from a hydrogen atom. And then the opposite of that would be its absorption. So if you've ever seen those spectral analysis, you'll see like lines of light and that looks like a rainbow across, Mm -hmm. right? But all of the other light colors are, are, you know, blacked out. And then you look at the absorption spectra, which would be all the ones that were blacked out above in the reflection Mm -hmm. spectra are now light. Yeah. Right? And then you see missing lines, black lines, for where it was reflected from. So this is what hydrogen would be. Hydrogen is both its spectral lines of emission or radiation, as well as its spectral lines of absorption. It's both. This carpet's not really only this color. right? It just happens to be the reflection spectra that we're looking at. Its real color, given that it's kind of this goldish color, is going to be kind of like a pale bluish type of color, that would be its absorption colors, Mm -hmm. right? So you understand this differential. So what if each of us has a unique light spectrum? And we do, it's called our DNA. We all have our own unique light spectrum, which is reflected. And there is no other ever in the history or in the future, exactly the same light signature than the one you have. 
right? Which is pretty remarkable in and of itself, right? The combination of light that you emit, which would be all of your, you know, all of the carbon, all the nitrogen, all the oxygen, all the hydrogen, and all the sulfur that makes up all of your DNA that allows you to sit in physical form in front of me, right? This is your reflection of light. But there's also an absorption that is you as well, right? But that absorption is reflected back to you in what you call the universe. Everything that is not you. So that's why I refer to it as the you inverse. Mm -hmm. And literally, mathematically, you have a number. It's a unique number that would be the amalgamation of all of this light signature. And one over that number, divided literally into the number one, becomes your entire experience in your you inverse. Mm. It's a beautiful mathematical relationship because anytime you take one over a number, like if I took the number seven, I took one over seven, it would give me 0.142857, and then those six digits would continue to repeat infinitely. That repetition cycle represents a sine-cosine wave, but it might also represent your experience with samsara. Hmm. And it might also represent your repetition cycles and patterns of the life that you were living. And you thought that all of it was you know the world happening to you when actually it was all predetermined and i literally mean predetermined hmm. by you for the experience that you wanted to have until the moment of realization where you can realize that you yourself are that one you are the universe experiencing itself through which you inverse this is how the universe experiences itself is by putting itself in these situations of limitation, you would never, if you're gonna create a spiritual life simulation game, you would never go into it with all your infinite powers making you omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Right. In fact, you would do the opposite. You would limit all of your powers so that you could have unique, subtle experiences until you came to the, uh, your own realization that you yourself are the divine. Man, so beautifully said. The, the Buddha said, consider the co-arising interconnected nature of all phenomena. And as you're speaking to, like, we choose this human birth, and you could say that we have selected a limited bandwidth s spectrum of light to express in this life for us to move through the energy or the math that we are here to move through in this lifetime. Like you said, like one over our individual number, right? We are going to attract not just what we want, but exactly a match to who we are in our in our reality. Why does that become an important realization when you want to become a manifester and creator in life? Because you realize one firsthand, you're obviously literally creating the reality as a reflection of who you are, but then it also opens up the possibility of responsibility for you to uh, expedite the, the process and move that process along faster, your spiritual journey to come into the one. Right when you realize it's a game, and then you're actually uh, knowing yourself as life, and not just as this limited identity structure that you've accumulated um, from from your upbringing. So, is there anything you want to touch on to how? Yeah, and this is, I think, where Near Eastern philosophies, um, and I and I make the distinction between philosophy and religion, because to me, religion is something that that pervades and tends to teach more judgment. Whereas um, spirituality tends to position it as transcendence of judgment. So you start to realize the things that you thought were good. Uh, I, I got in the mail the other day this, this very nice company. Uh, they have these products called Galactic Federation, and they sent me <laughs> all this stuff very kindly. Thank you, guys. It's really cool stuff. And, and they sent me a hat, and they sent me these cool shirts and everything. And... and um, the hat said light worker on it. And I immediately gave it, I gave it to one of my team members. I kept the shirts, right? Because the hat was a bit small anyway, but it was, and I don't usually wear caps. Um, but basically it said light worker. And I said, you know what? Maybe I would prefer a cap that said shadow worker. Mm. And the reason I said that is because of the same thing I just talked about. Recognizing the things that as we create our personas, and we say, this is not me. The first thing we do as soon as we feel shame is we cut a piece of ourselves off and separate it from us. I didn't do that. Adam, 
Why did you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil? Uh, the woman that thou gavest me commanded me that I should stay with her. She gave me of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I ate it. Eve, why did you do that? What did you do? Uh, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. From the very first experience we have of shame, we, we learn very rapidly and quickly. No one has to teach us how to blame. Shame leads to blame. So what we do is we don't want to associate with it anymore. So then what's the next step? We start to deflect. So the things that we don't like about ourselves, we start judging in everyone else. And as we judge it in everyone else, we only continue to attract that thing mm -hmm. as a constant reminder until we have that realization that I am that I am. And once we have that realization that the thing I'm judging is actually the thing I'm doing that I don't want to see, then your, your whole world kind of flips upside down. It's like I saw this funny meme. It had Matthew McConaughey on it. Mm -hmm. And it said, which stage of awakening are you in? <laughs> right? And the first one was like, everything is great. And I'm all happy they should have been seen from some movie where he was like a happy-go-lucky guy and everything. And then the next scene was like, nothing seems to be working out the way that it did before. <laughs> Things don't seem to be going right. And then the next scene was him on on uh, Interstellar crying. And he's like, <laughs> we're all screwed, right? It's like type of thing. And then the next scene was, you don't know, him talking to someone else about a conspiracy theory. You know, you don't understand. They're gonna like ring you dry of all your money and they've got all this power. <laughs> they're gonna suck the life out of you and they're gonna give you a vax, blah, blah, blah. And then the next one was get off my lawn, he's holding a gun, <laughs> right? And then the last one is him with like super long hair walking on a beach somewhere in Hawaii or whatever. And it says, I realize that my greatest revenge is to love everyone and everything. And I find it funny because actually you can literally track, so these memes are definitely good at helping elucidate and illuminate um, the experiences that we're going through. And they kind of do it in a nice, funny way. Right. Digestible but way as well. In a di Very rapid, and we need that in society today. If it takes more than 10 seconds to think about something, it's like useless, <laughs> right? about it. That's why I was watching Bill Maher this morning also, who's definitely swinging more to the right. I'm, I'm a centrist. I'm not Republican or Democrat. I'm, I'm non-dual in this. Mm. And, and it was funny, though, because he was like, you know, the schools are talking about what words you're not allowed to say anymore. And you may have seen this post I did on Stanford where they said the word American is not allowed anymore at Stanford University and the word brave is not allowed and they're supposed to give replacement words to give instead. And then there was no replacement word for brave because brave is uh, savage, right? And I was like, what the heck? And so I posted this thing and I'm like, what do you guys think about this? You know, I did a survey <laughs> on it and I copied Stanford University on the survey. Mm. And I said, how many of you think maybe Stanford we should consider defunding Stanford, right, for, you know, public education and from the state level um, with, with all of this stuff about that doesn't really matter. It's like, really? What are we talking about here? And 83% responded, yes, defund Stanford. The <laughs> next day, Stanford announced that they were no longer backing off the whole thing, and now they're going to put the whole process under review. Mm. <laughs> it's like, wow. it was lots of people responded to it. Yeah. So I, I think that the funny thing is the imp of the perverse is, is when cancel culture leads to them being canceled, that's how they get canceled, <laughs> right? Uh, there's a book by Robert Greene called The 48 Laws of Power. And I read it probably 20 years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago. And there were some really almost Machiavellian style principles on how to deal. It's a little bit of kind of like political jujitsu type of thing, right? And, and I think that in society today, we're seeing more and more of this because people wanted to carve off from themselves separation and then say it's everyone else doing it yeah. without being able to recognize that they themselves have been doing it. And it's, it's very funny. It's like, let's not use these words because it's offensive to some people, right? And you can understand that. It seems, seems decent, right? And until you get to the point where you become offensive by carving off words that people can't say. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why I think in this one, the Founding Fathers were right. Free speech is the First Amendment for a reason, Yeah. right? You, you can't get away from it, but and you need to have it. Otherwise, you can't have a functioning society in general. But I think the, the issue that you can notice through all of this is that these emanations that we see around us are reminders 
to accept the parts that we've carved off from ourselves. We start our life, we're born, we experience separation, we get separated from our mother, right? And we go through forming our own personas. And persona is the Latin word for mask. Mm -hmm. So I think a big part of why we went through COVID was this whole idea that, wait, we're all wearing masks, Mm. right? And now we need to take off the masks. The metaphorical ones. And then some people fell in love with their masks, (laughs) right? Some people literally fell in love with their mask. But the whole point was about metaphor. And um, it was uh, right before COVID, I was in Mexico. Um, It was November 11th, so 11-11. And I was hosting with Nassim Haramein uh, about 80 people in Mexico for a residence foundation trip. And at lunch, I told Nassim and Andrea and Victoria, who were working with us as well, I said, hey, I see us, I, I had this vision, and I see us on some sort of platform somewhere doing like the, some ceremony. I, I don't know what it is or why we're doing it, but we're like at the four cardinal you know, directions, and, and I see us doing a ceremony. And they all looked at me like, okay, Robert, you're, you're out of your mind type of thing. And I said, but when we go to the Temple of the Moon... We go to the top. Let's wait on top of that. And then maybe as everyone goes down, we'll do a quick thing for masculine, feminine balance or something. I feel like there's something that's going to happen. And um, so we, we got to doing our Facebook lives and, you know, Instagram lives and all that stuff up on top. And we had still good coverage there. And uh, I noticed that everyone except for me and Jamie had left. And so they'd already gone down the, uh, the pyramid. So I was kind of bummed. And I'm like, well, I guess they didn't stick around for this. And as we went down, we started walking back to the buses. It was around dusk. You know, the sun was going down. And um, one of the elders of the guardians of the Teotihuacan Plateau came over to us. His name was Gorilla. He's pretty famous. He's like a, a shaman, right? And, and he's one of the tribal leaders of the, of the Toltec tribe that is, you know, the guardians of the, of the Teotihuacan Plateau. And, and by the way, Tehuti... Teotihuacan, so Tehutihuacan. So Tehuti is Thoth. Hmm. Interesting, Mm -hmm. because all the math matches too. Yeah. Metatron, same thing. So we were walking down, and he says, "Uh, don't go to the buses. We're going to take you. Our tribe wants to do this special uh, ceremony with you. And so we had started going towards the buses, but he said, no, we're going to go to the heart of the feathered serpent. So there's a place on the Teotihuacan Plateau that is not far away from across from the, um, uh, you know, there's this whole thing called Walk of the Dead, right? And on the other side of it would be, on the left side of it, from where we were coming from the Temple of the Moon, would be the Temple of the Sun or the Pyramid of the Sun. And then on the other side is this Heart of the Feathered Serpent. So we go in there. There's about a four-foot, uh, you know, altar, you know, sort of platform. And he asks four of us to get up on top of it. And so I'm like... And I'd not told him, or we'd not discussed this. The only people I'd told were in the sim, and Andrea and Victoria. And he said, "Robert and the sim, you guys need to be up on top of this platform." And he um, he then said, "I need two of the two youngest women here, the two youngest women." And it happened that that was Andrea and Victoria to come up on the platform. We're going to stand on the four corners of this platform, and uh, we're going to do a ceremony, and we're going to. Uh, do a ceremony for Robert and the Sim to become shaman of the Toltec tribe. So I was like, whoa, right? And and it was like incense and everything. There's like, you know, 100 people all around mm-hmm. us. And it was a very, very spiritual experience. And I won't go into the details about it, but there were messages and everything, and it was really powerful. Mm-hmm. And I have an epic photograph of it too, which is amazing. The sun coming down, someone captured it. One of our photograph crew, I think, you know, climbed up somewhere and got this awesome photograph of it. You can see the beam of light coming right down in the center of it. It was amazing. At the end of it, he gave me a flute, which he'd been carrying for 40 years. It was a conch shell flute that had a phoenix painted on it. Mm. So it was about the size of my hand, about the size of a heart. And he said, this is the heart and this is the flute for you to play to awaken the hearts of men. And you have to play this at all the sacred sites that you go to around the world. And and he said, you have access to cosmic knowledge that you must share. And then he gave a mask 
that he had been wearing around his neck the whole day, though we'd seen him there as well, this, this mask that had a Thunderbird painted on it, which is the opposite of the phoenix. So you could say it's the shadow of the phoenix, yeah. right? And there was a Thunderbird painted on it, and, and he handed Nassim the mask. And so Nassim got this mask, and I got this flute. And Nassim was also given, you know, uh, asked to, to bring wisdom to the world and, and his understandings and teachings, et cetera. One week later, the entire world was starting to wear masks. And about two months later, I went to Egypt. And I guess it was in February, so this was in November. February, I went to Egypt right before all the lockdowns, like literally the week before all the lockdowns. I almost got stuck in Egypt. There were 80 of us there, 50 of us there on that trip that almost got stuck in Egypt, which would have been really tough to get back from. And uh, it, was, it was amazing, but um, I got to bring the flute into the king's chamber, and they never let you bring any instruments in there to play or anything. Oh. And I got to lay in the sarcophagus and, and play this flute. Damn. And, um, and, you know, that's one of many places that I will go and play this flute around to. And I actually have the recording of it, and you can hear the king's chamber resonating and the sarcophagus. I was laying in the sarcophagus while I was doing it. And it was one of the most powerful experiences of my entire life. What we are experiencing in this world, the truth of it, is so much stranger than any fiction story than you could ever, ever imagine. It's not even imaginable in many cases. The divinity that we are and what we truly are is so much broader, so much more significant and we have limited ourselves to be in this experience so that we can experience all of these things. So that we can live and, and feel the experiences that people would feel and then learn eventually to recognize and remember who we are as we come towards the end of our periods, of whether it's our, our repetition cycle or what's called a period in this one over X number. Mm -hmm. It's always a repeating cycle. Um, and once we finally recognize it, then it's like waking up and it's the stage of the hero's journey. We're all on a hero's journey. Like Matthew McConaughey and that meme. <laughs> exactly right. And so the hero's journey, that's why every story that we experience in the movies or whatever are always following, even video games and everything, always follow the hero's journey. Yeah. So Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And all he did was take all these different cultural stories and then amalgamated them all and then said, wait, this is the same theme that every story has, like literally every story. I think there's some exceptions to that in Asia, especially because mm -hmm. in Asia, I lived in Japan, I lived in Korea, all their stories have tragic endings, mm. right? <laughs> They're all tragic <laughs> endings. But American and Western stories always have this sort of hero's journey yeah. ending, which are like really, really, oh, okay, everything works out and you have freedom to live. Freedom to live. So this transition goes from samsara, this cycle of repetition, until the moment you realize that you're living this repetition. And then you start doing things differently. And as you start doing things differently, you now enter into, okay, I can play in this game. It's like lucid dreaming. It's transitioning the lucid dream. Have you ever lucid had lucid yeah. dreaming oh, before? Yeah. And I remember the first time I did it, I was like in the water. <laughs> I was like swimming, right? I was diving somewhere, but I was at the surface. And I realized I was in a dream and I was like, wait, I'm dreaming. So that means I can do anything in this place. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to fly. So I actually lifted my body just, you know, with my thought and intention out of the water. All my friends were still in the water. And I'm like over them going, hey, guys. <laughs> and I knew the whole time I was dreaming. And I got to fly all around and do all this. We'll take that exact experience and now apply it to living in the material world. When you realize that you've been in the dream that is this world. You can now play in it, and what Buddhists refer to this as is lila. Lila is the experience of being able to play in the illusion and live out the, the aspects of your hero's journey that are associated with that new stage of dimensional perception. And that is a big shift because then you start realizing that you were the creator all along and maybe 
even decisions. Like I used to think, oh, I'm successful because I work hard. Maybe I was just successful because that's the path I chose. And let's not be arrogant to believe that we could understand why everyone would choose the particular path they chose. One's man's, one man's trash, one woman's trash is another's treasure. And, you know, if we're playing in a game, I would tell you at the beginning of the game or at the end of the game, I'm like, oh yeah, this next time I want to have an epic death or I want to have like a experience where I'm going to like, you know, get chased by the sheriff of Nottingham or I'm going to end up, you know, jumping off of a building and, you know, I die that way. If you knew that death wasn't real, would you change the things you do in this life? And that's really what Leela is. Yeah. Yeah, man. There's there's a lot that you touched on that I want to open up. The hypnotic rhythm that the vast majority of the human population find themselves in within this dream that they're not awake to. Very much so like, uh, you know, Neo in the Matrix waking up to, oh, this is I've been in this Matrix. And the process of realizing that we are in a dream of sorts. Very much so like... I like to give the analogy of oftentimes we're absorbed in the content of our experience where we go to a movie theater and the whole the whole thing is set up for us to get absorbed in the movie. The lights dim, we're so we're but you love in. it, right? I mean that's, I love when I get absorbed in a movie. Of course. So. You, you don't want to hear background noise, you don't want to oh. hear, you know, other things that are going on. It's very uh, enchanting. But then if you were to take that same movie and put it out on a big field where it's sunny outside and you can't see the screen as much, you still see it there, but you're not as easily engaged within the movie. You know, if a plane goes overhead, you're distracted. It becomes less real of an experience. Then when we go into this place where we're absorbed within the awareness of, of who we are and we place whatever the content of our experience is in that larger context of awareness, then we see the movie of our life happening and playing out in front of us, but we're not attached to the outcomes and circumstance because we realize it's a movie. And if it's a happy movie, we're not, we don't have to be happy. If it's a sad movie, we're not tied to being sad. We're in the first part where we're absorbed in the immediate movie screen of our experience. If it's a nightmare, nightmarish movie, we're going to have a nightmarish experience. And I think you're speaking here to having a larger expanded awareness allows us to realize the movie that we're in. And with that comes freedom. With that comes not being so attached to the cer certain circumstances in our experience. And that alleviates a lot of the suffering. And then we can become a creator of circumstance and not just a creature. It's exactly what Alan Watts meant when he said, man only suffers because he takes seriously what the gods created for fun. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's exactly what it is. And we all get stuck into it. So, and we don't even realize that the more things that we're judging, all we will do by judging it more is attracting it more. Yeah. So that's really tough for people that are big time into, I'm a advocate for the environment we become the proverbial hammer that's searching for the nail. Or if you think that you want to help people that are victimized all the time, then maybe all you'll end up experiencing is more and more victimhood. Or if you think you're victimized all the time, then you'll only become that hammer that seeks that nail of victimhood. So we attract everything we judge until we no longer attract no longer judge what we attracted. Yeah. That's the point of it, right? We have to understand and having that realization, it, and it turns everything upside down because then you start thinking, well, geez, how many things did I judge? And I kept experiencing it. You'll stop experiencing those same samsara cycles once you stop judging it. Learn to love and accept it. Learn to fall in love with your destiny, with your path. Realize that all of it's connected. Every person you meet, every experience you have is divine. If we can notice how it is divine. And instead of asking, why did the universe do this to me? And what it did for me is it shifted my thinking to, why did I choose this for myself? What was the principle I was hoping to learn? And I can fall in love with that. And that's called amor fati, the love of destiny. Mm -hmm. I used to think... I used to believe in coincidences. I used to believe in um, might makes right. I used to believe that my willpower could create whatever it is I wanted. And I used to think there was a juxtaposition between willpower and destiny. Hmm. But maybe 
what we call destiny is really just the free will of our higher selves. I think that's a powerful reframe. It takes the pressure off of us feeling like we have to figure out and force our path, which that is not a recipe for happiness, my friend. <laughs> no, just go with the river. Yeah. Right? Uh, a quote that I heard that I really love is, when the heart thinks and when the mind feels, the river of wisdom flows. And we can then be carried by that river to our destiny, and we just have to simply learn to surrender to that destiny. It'll take us exactly the places that we always were intended to go. So I started thinking, wait, all the things I used to like use my manifestation skills and powers and everything to be able to make happen didn't really matter because those were just all the things I chose. So I didn't have to exert all that energy because it was all destined anyway. Yeah, and most people think of choice just at the conscious level, but the unconscious choices that we're making. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's what that's what you're speaking to and how there's no such thing as you spoke to randomness and coincidence. A coincidence is like a an occurrence of events with no apparent call, causal reason, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And when the, the more you expand your awareness and th see things from a more holistic sense, you see the interconnected nature of things and that, no, this everything actually has a cause and an effect. Um, how would speak to that and how important it is to find on the path of integration of that brain and heart connection? Because I feel like that is, that's how we become fully activated human beings. So we don't realize this, but our hearts actually have brain-type tissue in them, right? It's right around the sinoatrial node. I used to work in cardiology. And it's funny, now I look back on my career, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in medical aesthetics, which is really all about the mask, in a way. I, at one point in my career, I was the leader of the medical aesthetics industry, the whole industry. It, it seems so foreign to me now, right? Which is kind of funny. But... Um, and it was funny also as well because one of the companies that I uh, co-founded is a company called Evelis, which I didn't ever like the name because it sounded like when people mispronounced it, they would say Evilus. <laughs> and I'm like, it sounds like evil us. <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I had a big epiphany because I had felt like, you know, that had led to a lot of the challenges I'd faced in 2016, a lot of the greed issues, everything that I was experiencing that I had chosen that I had chosen for these realizations. And the big epiphany I had one day was I kept, I kept thinking, well, Evelis is a neurotoxin. It's like a Botox. You know, it's toxic. It's caused a lot of greed and all this stuff. And it, it's why the VCs wanted to have a battle with me over it and everything, which ultimately I luckily won. But I felt like I lost. And because the collateral damage was so great in the process. But the big realization I had one day was that it's not evil us. It's love us backwards. Mm -hmm. And when I had that realization, it's like, wait, I kept thinking it was all so superficial. It's all about beauty and all this stuff. And I had become the hammer that was seeking the nail. And, and I think that was my, one of the major reasons I came here to live is to learn how to transcend these judgments so that I could experience unconditionality of love. So... If you're here to learn unconditional love, you will experience betrayal. Yeah. And you will judge because you want that unconditional love so badly, you judge everything that is anathema to that thing, and then you'll just keep experiencing it over and over and over again until you finally realize, oh, it's me that has to learn the unconditional love. Right. It's like we want strength, but we judge when something difficult comes in our experience that will make us strong. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So I then started realizing as I started transcending through these things and figuring out that, wait, it's not that I got to blame anyone else. It's me that's got to figure this out. Yeah. It's, it's all internal to me. That's when I started having big epiphanies in life. And then the things that I had previously thought were coincidence, I started realizing none of it's coincidence. All of it's connected. Literally everything is connected. Every synchronicity. I started with, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and it would always be like, one eleven, or you know, I would I would keep seeing the number one thirty seven everywhere, 
And then the next was 432. And I thought, that's weird because a circle with circumference 432 has a diameter of 137 and a half. This is really strange. Like, why is all this stuff coming up? And these are the signatures of your higher self or your subconscious side peeking through to speak to you. There's a wall, right? A veil where we think we're separate from the world around us. It's the veil between X and one over X. And that veil is self-imposed. And it can also be self-overcome, right? And, and on the other side of that veil and the merger of those two things is when you find your true genius. You know, Walter Russell said, genius is self-bestowed and mediocrity is self-inflicted. <laughs> it's through our own judgments that we can either open and expand our perception to be able to experience our own inner genius or continue to limit ourselves by making it separate from us. This is only embodied through the heart-brain consciousness. Now, I've always been a logos-oriented person, a left-brained oriented person. I was always good at math. I chose business because I didn't want to be pigeonholed into one type of career. I was interested in, in law. I was interested in medicine. I was interested in business. I was interested in all those things. I just didn't want to be stuck in only one thing. And what was interesting for, for me is to realize that as I expanded my perception across many different fields, and polymathy just means many learnings. That's all it means. Um, you know, I was a musician who gave up music because I wasn't going to be making money at music, but I never really gave it up. I just didn't tell people I was a musician anymore. I always had artistic aspirations and qualities, but I, I just didn't really show the world my art anymore because it wasn't part of the persona that I'd created for who I was going to be as a serious businessman. I'm an investor. I'm a serious business guy who leads industries and as a CEO, that's not stuff that CEOs do. But as I started to embrace those softer aspects, which I would say were more on the feminine for myself, the feminine energies, um, then you get access like a portal to higher wisdom. And it's the wisdom that comes as a result of being able to expand your perception you're no longer playing this game of polarity of like saying, okay, I'm going to be the Democrat who fights a Republican or the Republican who fights the Democrat. I, I just couldn't do that anymore. And by getting beyond that is when I started tapping into a higher knowledge that I had never before experienced. It was through acceptance and love. And then the heart starts to take on its role. You know, at the sinoatrial node, one of the jobs I had, as I mentioned, my first job, I was a cardiac tech, cardiac tech. <laughs> and I look back now, I'm like, okay, I was in the medical aesthetics industry. I was in cardiac. I was in ophthalmology. And all of these are fundamentally important to what I'm doing now, <laughs> right? And perception is all about the eye, right? And even I just read recently that the eyes are actually the last part of the brain to develop. And actually, they're just the brain that's exposed to the outer world. Yeah. And I found that very fascinating. And if you really study like the retina and rods and cones and things like macular edema and age-related macular degeneration and lens um, degradation over time, cataract, et cetera, which I do, and I have lots of intellectual property in those fields, right? The two most important areas that I would have chosen would have probably been cardiology, and ophthalmology, and those are the areas. Now, in retrospect, I would have chosen that. Yeah. So it's like I must have chosen it in the very beginning, right, even before coming here, if there's a such thing as before, right, because maybe it's all just now. Hmm. And I've just created this matrix game for me to experience. But the heart has the sinoatrial node, which actually has a brain in it. And you can think with your heart. It's not... It's not as familiar. It's not as easy to do, but you can definitely do it. And the heart brain means that you can not only access the heart aspect, right, which is really at the top of your heart, um, and there's a specific geometry for it, and you could think of it even as its own separate chakra as well. But beyond that, you also can cross the corpus callosum, which is a connective tissue that separates the left and right brains. 
And when people suffer from epilepsy, one of the things that they have to do is they will often have a procedure done which will separate their brain so that they can't get this electrical, you know, sort of explosion going across both the hemispheres of the brain. And that stops their seizures. We have the same thing with people that suffer from atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation, or if they have something that is a, an errant pathway, Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome is also what it's called, then you have to have a cardiac ablation. This would be the similar type of procedure analogous to separation of the corpus callosum. But our highest divinity and our highest wisdom and understanding comes when we can think with both sides, both the rational and the irrational, both the masculine and the feminine, both the line and the curve. And a world without curves is not a very beautiful world. <laughs> so being able to transcend that and then have the heart really lead that decision process, and that also enables you to be able to surrender to the universe's divine plan and wisdom for you, you're now operating connected to the universe. You're not separate from it and fighting against it. Because you realize the universe isn't happening to me, it's happening for me. For you and through you. And I feel like as you, you're speaking to raising your awareness, you start to feel into how the nature of intelligence is orchestrating you to, to become that one, to, to realize that you are the one and there is all is in one and one is in all. And that's why Neo's name was Neo, right? You can see it's just, a rearrangement of the same letters of the number one. Yeah. And in that movie, like you see all the things that show up as almost synchronicities, right? It's like, uh, and I think of deja vu all, all often as well. I'd love to get your opinion on that, but we become available to synchronicities and actually becoming aware of them much more in our daily life. Is there anything you want to touch on with that? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you an example. So, uh, when I founded my company, I, uh, the first company I, I named was a company called Alfion. And the original name I kept seeing it was A-E-O-N. A-E-O-N. And I kept seeing like ringing the you know, New York Stock Exchange bell or something. I could see it and it was like a ticker symbol, A-E-O-N. I was like, okay. Then I looked up the company and the company's name was taken. So Aon was taken and the ticker symbol was taken. And so I was like, well, I can't call it A-E-O-N. I'll call it Alfion. Maybe that company will sell and something will change and so I'll be able to capture it later on. So a few years later, I started this company, uh, Alfion. It grew very fast. It became a unicorn very quickly. And uh, we went to register it. It wasn't going to be on the New York Stock Exchange. It was going to be on the NASDAQ. And um, so we grabbed the company that had the ticker before, it got sold in the meantime. And so we grabbed the name AEON. So I was like, okay, that's symbolic. That's really cool. So it'll be Alfion with the ticker AEON. Well, then Alfion ended up um, going the route of becoming the second largest healthcare lender in, in the United States. So we do uh, consumer lending and everything through this business. And, and then the other healthcare aspects of it, we sort of separated out. And, and we founded another company in 20, early 2019 called Aon. AEON. Mm. So it was part of the same company, just sort of spun out of the same company. And now that company just announced that it's basically going public via SPAC, SPAC merger, right? And in the next few months, uh, it'll be done probably, you know, next couple, two, three months. And it's so funny to me because there's going to be a bell ringing. And I had no idea, right, that the circuitous path this was going to have to take for it to end up being the truth. Now, was it my commitment to it? Who knows? I don't know. I didn't really think about it that much in the meantime. It just was almost serendipity. It was just like happenstance in a way that it just kept working out. And, and then now, all these years later, it's exactly what's happening. It's been 11 years since that time. So I could look at that and I could say, huh, what a coincidence. That's a quinky dink. Or just like I've survived through three plane crashes. Someone that sees the glass half full would, like me, see it as, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I've lived through three plane crashes. Oh, my gosh. And yet, sometimes I travel with people that are like, I don't want to fly with you. <laughs> like, you're like bad luck, you know? It's like, that's super unlucky. I'm like, I've survived three plane crashes. I'd say that's pretty lucky. <laughs> 
But do you see what I mean? Yeah. Anything that you experience could be seen in one context or another, and it might be radically different. I have a friend whose son was killed in a suicide bombing, 11-year-old son, in Sri Lanka, which was a retaliation bombing that happened by jihadists um, after they felt they had to retaliate against a killing that had occurred in New Zealand by a neo-Nazi on a mosque with 50 people dying. But Sri Lanka is more than 3,000 miles away from New Zealand. How are the two things even related? But the suicide bomber was hailed as a hero. But the only person that died besides himself in this bombing was an 11-year-old boy who was entirely innocent. And yet, it's a war. So in his family, in his village, in his you know, peer group, the suicide bomber is a hero. It's hard for us to say what is right and what is absolutely wrong. Very difficult. And this has been one of the oldest things throughout time. <laughs> you have a shepherd in the Middle East somewhere who had a really tough summer and the crops or, or the, the hillside has been destroyed by the sun. It's very dry. And the other that's covered by shade still has grass on it. So he looks over and he says, oh, my neighbor over there has really green pastures and I don't. And you know what? It's amazing. He worships a different God. And last night, my God appeared to me and told me to kill him and take his land and consecrate it to my God. This is the oldest story in the book. There is no older story than this. We can't separate what we think of as right and wrong from our own bias and benefit. That's another thing that has to be recognized. So when I looked at this name Aeon, I later learned... Aeon, in the Greek sense, uh, means gods, right? the gods. The Greek gods are often referred to as aeons. They could have been spelled A-E-O-N. It's also a reference to time, aeons of time, right? Um, and A-I-O-N is another spelling for it as well because it's really this ligatured A-E in Greek. But what's interesting is that there's also a book written by Carl Jung, by the name of Aeon, which was about the individuation path. Hmm. The phenomenology of self. and The phenomenology of self. Now, I had no idea about any of this when I came up with it, but I, I knew there was something special to it, and I knew that one of the meanings to the word Aeon was I am. So, And also, if you look at it, it's A-E-O-N. <laughs> You've got the same letters besides the letter A as the number one, right? And that's kind of interesting. So there's something to gematria also. Maybe you've heard of gematria, where you can actually read the Bible in different forms of Greek gematria, English gematria, simple gematria, and there are numbers that are basically significant to each one. So in simple gematria, the letter A would be the number one. Got it. And in Greek gematria, it would be the same. But there's 24 numbers, right, uh, that would then be associated with a Greek alphabet. But what's interesting is that they didn't actually have a numbering system. So if you go back in time... The Greek language was, the, the letters of their language was their numbering system. And that was true all the way up until the advent of the Arabic numerical system, right? So that means that literally gematria was embedded into everything from Greek, right? If, if the number one, the number two is B, the number three is gamma, right, or C, which is from camel, gimel, and, and bet is house, so... Aleph Bet would be bull house. Aleph means bull, right? And that's true in all those, most of the Semitic languages, right? So alpha. So when you start realizing the whole thing is connected, there's nothing that's not connected. And then I learned that in Greek, when you flip a word around, it also has a meaning very often. So what is the opposite of aeon? No way. Have you ever heard of noetics? Mm hmm. Yeah. Noetics Institute, which is about thought and consciousness. So now aeon on one direction means I am, and in the other means I think. Is this all coincidence? <laughs> and both are irrevocably tied to the number one, just like Neo is with one. Mm -hmm. These are realizations 
that we come to and we can actually find the divinity in all of it. And so some people might look at that and say, that's just all pure coincidence, Robert. You're, you're totally out of your mind. <laughs> well, okay. But when you start looking at mathematics and probabilities, it doesn't work. It falls apart on its face. <laughs> Why is it that the latitude of the Great Pyramid is exactly down to one meter per second perfection, the exact speed of light? 29.9792458 degrees north is the latitudinal reference of the center of the Great Pyramid. Okay, so then people say, but that's only one of the axes. Okay, what's the other axis? The other axis is 31 degrees, 8 minutes and 3.1 sec seconds, which comes out to be exactly 1 over pi. So one axis is the speed of light and the other axis is 1 over pi? Really? So that means that I've got nine digits to get 299,792,458 meters per second. And then now I've got another six digits in the 31 degrees, eight minutes, right, um, and 3.1 seconds. So for me to pick perfectly exactly 15 digits of accuracy, uh, that's like 10 to the 15th power. <laughs> right? Then it's going to land exactly on those? I mean, please. Really? We live in a simulation. <laughs> As, before we go into uh, how, like the possibility or like, I guess, who in your, in your thought, like how and how the pyramids were, were built and potentially by who, what are some other mathematics that are encoded within the pyramids? That, oh, geez. I mean, okay. I know this is a rabbit hole that we could spend hours <laughs> on, but if you just want to share okay. a few, because... It's, All right, it, I'll tell you one. Yeah. Metatron's cube. So the Greek system of geometry was all about how do you draw geometric forms without any measurement? Because God, in his creation, doesn't have to use a ruler, right? So that means that it has to be perfect ratio-based. We live in a ratio-based universe that has to be perfect at all scales, all based on ratio. In order for us to know something... It's kind of like, how do you know what pleasure is if you can't experience pain? So think of it as two lines, right? Two lines of perspective. One line of perspective would be, this is what I know and I feel like, and the only thing real in this universe is the emotions that we take from our perceptions, even misperceptions of the world around us, or misguided perceptions sometimes. And I experience this is what pain is, and then there's another line of what pleasure is. And then we can contrast the two because without the context of what the, its opposite is, and then you start realizing that, wait, okay, so if I'm a communist, then I'm a left winger, right? But why is it that if I look throughout history, every single case where there was communism, like attempted, it always became fascist regimes without exception. I mean, I study political science and hegemonic stability and everything. There's never once been a successful communist society that didn't devolve into fascism and despotic autocracy. It's just a fact. So when people say to me, okay, I want to go for communism, I understand the intention behind it. I get it. It's, it's very seductive. But the truth is, it's never happened. And there have been many attempts. Right? So what's, what's up with that? You know, it's like, the, the best form of government is probably a really good, righteous king. And the worst form of government is a really bad king. So in order to avoid really bad kings, we have democracy. So it's like the least worst of all government forms. Okay, maybe there's something better. And I actually see maybe something coming in the future, but who knows? You know, maybe there's technology that can intercede on this too, like blockchain, which I think has a voting mechanism and yeah. it could be better. But having said all of that, the point is that everything has to be ratio-based. So the key to being able to square a circle, for example, is I can square a circle if I can measure it. I can square it on my computer if I can measure it. But if I can't measure it, how could I ever draw it perfectly? And for people that aren't familiar with that term, squaring the circle is essentially... Squaring the circle can be done in two ways. One way is you match the perimeter of the square is the exact same length to the circumference of the circle. Okay, so you draw a circle and you draw a square with the exact same length. Now you could say, wait, that's not possible because the circle is irrational, right? And, and the square 
you know, is, is not irrational, but it could still be irrational because you could have, if you have the exact perfect length, you could have the square root of pi, for example. If the perimeter of the, of the square has to be pi, then the square root would be one of its sides. And, and you could have, you know, the circumference of the circle be pi. And then you could match it. So it is possible. It's possible to do it. And you can watch number file on this as well. If you do it on a computer and you can perfectly measure it, on GeoGebra, you can do it accurate to 17 decimal digits of accuracy. GeoGebra is a Google program, and I use it all the time. But, and, and I'm talking about the level of variance on that is, is 100 times smaller than one hydrogen atom. Okay, so that's pretty accurate, yeah. no matter how you look at it. But the thing is, is that you have to be able to do this with just pencil and straight edge, and there can't even be any lines of measurement on the straight edge and a compass. That's it. Pencil, straight edge, and a compass. So how can you do this? And there are three sets of impossible problems that the Greeks always tried to solve, right? The first of these was squaring the circle. How do you square the circle? One way is the way I mentioned. The other way is that you could square the circle by matching the area of the square with the circle. So that's a different calculation, right? So the, the square would be a different size than it would if you were just doing it for perimeter matching circumference basis, right? Yeah. But how can you do either one of these with no measurement? That's tough. Got to be tapped in. <laughs> you got to be tapped in. And, <laughs> and the ancient Greek philosophers believed that squaring the circle was a meditative practice that allowed you to balance the energies of the feminine and the masculine to tap into this higher genius. That was the purpose. That was what becoming a philosopher was really all about. And philosophy was not the study of rhetoric as it is today, a bunch of people talking about their opinions and the opinions of others throughout time. Philosophy was an end result that came as a function of being a polymath, learning many, many things, breaking down judgments, because if you're only in hyper-specialization, the end result of that is you become polarized mm -hmm. because you can only see the world through the lens that you've chosen to see, through, see it through. Right, it's as simple as that. Yeah. So to the become idea, a lo lover of wisdom, right? Lover of wisdom is what the word philosophy means, right? Oh. And and philomath is what my first book was named, is lover of learning. Mm -hmm. Mathematics in the Greek sense did not mean and before Aristotle, and there were a lot of people that before Aristotle. So you had Socrates before Aristotle, you had Plato, you had Pythagoras, <laughs> right? Aristotle was more of a botanist who decided to classify the word mathematics from its original meaning and narrow its meaning. Because that's what botanists do. They make classifications like phylotypes yeah. and haplotypes and all this. So what he did is he came and said, you know what, you guys under Plato at the academy referred to mathematics as the language of all learning, the seat of all knowledge. You know, on the academy, at the academy of Plato, there was a sign above the door let no man who knows not geometry enter here, hmm. right? Because they felt that that was the connection to the divine. You go back to the Pythagoreans, same thing. You know, they had some really weird esoteric stuff, the Tetractus, and words that were not supposed to be uttered, right? And they were understanding this notion of rationality and irrationality. They were on the verge of really getting a deeper understanding of wisdom around it. But what this means is that if you can balance the square and the circle accurately without measurement, and you can just do it naturally, then you have achieved a degree of philosophy. You've achieved, you've gone beyond polymathy to philosophy. So my next book is going to be called Philosopher, right? And in the ancient sense of the word, not in what philosophy means today. Mm -hmm. In the ancient sense, it was a true lover of wisdom. So you have philomath, a lover of learning, not the study of quantity, a lover of all learning, because that's what mathematics meant. And then polymath is many learnings. And then the third step is philosopher, and that's why they called it the philosopher's stone. You could actually say that a philosopher in the ancient sense was more of a magician, right, who was equally balanced between their brain hemispheres, so Leonardo da Vinci, philosopher. That's why their words somehow have some transcendence, and we study them today. Yeah. They're the ones who discovered pretty much all the science that is at the root of all of our learning in university. But now we've irrevocably changed what it means to be a philosopher. You get a doctorate in philosophy, but you know nothing about philosophy, right? You're a hyper-specialist. 
So this is one of the problems with our education system today because it's, it's running anathematically towards a direction that polarizes society, mm-hmm. not integrates it. That's a, a whole other discussion. Yeah. But this idea of being able to find these mathematical correlations and do it naturally means that you have to do it with intersections. So Metatron's cube, the reason I can draw every geometry in Metatron's cube and, and using a four-point you know, repetition of Metatron's cube to get a 24-point cycle around it, which is what the prime number pattern is based on too, is because within its lines of intersection, you can find all of those geometric shapes. You just find where they naturally intersect. So you, it's like playing connect the dots. It's very simple, actually. It's super simple. So in that, you can find the icosahedron, the dodecahedron, and everything. So the idea is, are there lines that we can put as a structure to find the way to square the circle using intersections somehow? Are there natural intersections? And the answer is there are. But it's very closely kept up until now. It has been something that it was not intended to be part of this timeline until now. And now we can actually release it to the world. And that's basically what's happening. And that's what's very exciting. So the Great Pyramid, if it is a perfect structure, should have been built using the same principles. But what are those principles? What's it based on? Well, Thoth says, built I the Great Pyramid in the Emerald Tablets. Right? He says it straight up. Quite the statement there, though. So then I started searching for maybe there's an intersection in Metatron's cube that gives me exactly the pyramid side face. Mm -hmm. And I was on an airplane, (laughs) and I don't know what it was, but I just had this burst of inspiration. I'm like, oh, I just have to connect this dot to this dot and then place a point here and then draw a circle from the base of Metatron's cube, which is the base of the star point, and make that the radius then that gives me the exact base width of the Great Pyramid and then draw the top peak of the pyramid right to the center of Metatron's cube and let's see if that's 51.8536 degrees. And it is. So this means that the Giza Plateau and not just the Great Pyramid but all three pyramids and even the plateau itself is derived from the inherent intersections of Metatron's cube. That's the perfect geometry of it. And by the way, the Great Pyramid, just drawing that exact thing, gives you the exact perspective and line. The top of that circle becomes a circle that then one half of the base width of the pyramid will have a square that's easy to construct from that will have the exact same perimeter value as the to the peak of the Great Pyramid representing a circle at the base of the ground up to the top of the Great Pyramid. So the pyramid is actually the only triangular face that can square the circle. No other shape of triangle, not an equilateral triangle, can do this. Only an isosceles triangle with the exact proportions of the Great Pyramid can actually square the circle. And not only that, but the area of the pyramid side face as a cross section uh, versus the area of that circle, that same circle is identical. So you've triangled the circle or sometimes referred to as trining the circle, through this divinity of this triangle. So the mathematics of the Great Pyramid is beyond any doubt absolutely perfect. It it answers the question. It is the cipher key to squaring the circle. In fact, you can square the circle just by knowing the proportions of the pyramid and from that work it backwards. But the way to come to that proportion is to draw Metatron's cube and then just connect two dots inside Metatron's cube. I did a video posting on it. You can also find it on my website on this connection, and it's absolutely accurate. So it really led to me thinking, okay, well then, I guess it was Metatron. I guess it was Thoth. So that's where that's where it's led you to this day. You you do believe, and like how? How, how could it have perfectly come together in your understanding, or at least the best guess that you have currently in this life, how Thoth or Hermes mm-hmm. Trismegistus mm-hmm. would have been able to orchestrate such a creation. It's just like I said, Teotihuacan is like Tehuti Huacan, right? Tehuti is the other name for Thoth. 
-hmm. Feathered Serpent also, which is just Kundalini rising, same thing. Staff of Hermes. Um, when you look throughout history and find the name of the original architects that even the mainstream archaeologists believe was the architect for the Great Pyramid, they call him uh, Hemiunu, which is like Hermi, Hermes, right? It's the same thing. It's, the pronunciations are slightly different, but it's the same thing. And you find that signature all over. Now, the other things that I think would be most salient, because I think for the reductionists out there, um, I want you to know that people are like, oh, but wait, you're using the speed of light in meters per second, and how could this relate to the Great Pyramid when there was no meter when the pyramid was built? Good question. Okay, well, the king's chamber has a perimeter of exactly 31.4159 meters, which is exactly pi times 10. How did that happen? And the entry into the king's chamber is one meter high. So they, they must have been measuring something. And actually, if you look at it, it's all part of inherent geometry. Because if I take the number six, which is the fathom, six feet, and the first reference to the mile and first reference to feet, etc., were embedded inside of Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest book on the planet. We don't have, if you try to find the origination of astrology, you will not be able to find the first reference in history because beyond the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's mentioned right there. And it's the same as the Western type of, of zodiac that we have today. That's pretty remarkable, don't you think? <laughs> That's super remarkable. So where did it come from? How did it get there? And then when you really dig deep into it, you find out that legend has it that Thoth gave it to us along with all the measurements as well. So wait a minute. The pyramid then clearly used the meter in it. It's a natural proportion of even the indentations on the sides of the pyramid are one meter. They're, you know, because there's actually eight sides of the pyramid. It's not, it's not only four sides. They have slight indentations, and, and that indentation is, is one meter. And it's one over, it's one... Um, it's 0 .00432 of the length of the, the side, which is 432 long cubits as well. And when you start looking at this and, and relating it back to other sites like Mexico, for example, Teotihuacan, the height of the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico is 216 feet. The height of the smallest pyramid on the Giza Plateau is called Menkare, Menkare Pyramid, is 216 feet. The base width of the Great Pyramid of 756 feet is the identical base width of the Pyramid of the Sun, 756 feet. How could this be, right? I mean, it's too uncanny. The base width of the, of the Pyramid of the Moon in Mexico is 481 feet, and the height of the Great Pyramid in, in Egypt is 481 feet. It's the same. The designer of the Teotihuacan, Tehutihuacan, Plateau is the same, I believe, or at least operating on the same knowledge as the designer and builder of the Teotihuacan and Giza Plateau pyramids. And very likely, I've found connections to the, the Faroe Island pyramids as well, the Bosnian pyramids. They're all based on these same harmonic numbers. So then you then have to ask the question, then did they have access to a meter? Did they know the meter? Well, if you take six feet for fathom, which is just father, fathom, mother, backwards, right? Father, father, mother, six feet and subtract the Euler number, remarkably, you get one meter, right? Six feet minus the Euler number gives you 3.281 feet. <laughs> so wait a minute. This means that they had the knowledge of the Euler number? I believe they did as well because the Great Pyramid is built all on that exact same Euler and pi relationship. In fact, the solution to squaring the circle, you have to understand the concept of Euler. And that's why da Vinci didn't square the circle when he drew the Vitruvian man. The area of the square should have been pi and the area of the circle should have been pi from a ratio perspective. But actually the area of his square is the Euler number 2.718, which is not 3.14159 
And the Euler number was only supposed to have been discovered by Isaac Newton 200 years later. Hmm. So wait a minute. How could all this be so perfect? <laughs> and that's the point. You know, the other two things that are the impossible tasks are doubling the cube. How do you double the cube? You know, this started in a plague with Plato, and he went to the Senate and was like, what do we do? We got to figure out how to overcome this COVID problem that we've got amongst their population that, that raged on for eight years and killed lots and lots of people. So they said, go to talk to the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle of Delphi said, the answer is you have to double the cube of Delos. The cube of Delos was the altar to the sun god, Apollo. And if you can perfectly double it, then all sickness will be eradicated from the land. And so the Greek mathematicians are like, how do we solve this? How can we do without measurement exactly the increase of one side of that cube to double the volume? Well, the answer is the cube root of two. So you have to find the solution to the cube root of two. How can you do it? Well, da Vinci did it perfectly. He took the base of his square that had the Euler number as its area. You take one half of it and use that as one and then take the navel to the upper corner of the square, the navel being the center of the circle, to the upper corner of the square is the cube root of two. So now you can double the cube volume. It's through a construction box. What da Vinci left us with this missized square with his circle was the construction box necessary to know the intersections of how to square the circle correctly. It was a construction box, just like a golden ratio construction box. We can use it. There's no measurements involved in it. You can construct it. He created a construction box. And then the third problem is trisecting the angle. How can you take an arbitrary angle and trisect it? And I discovered a method. And as I drew it, the solution was that it looked like an owl. All of it came out like an owl. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. It's like the wisdom of the owl. And by the way, you know what the Euler number means in German? So Euler number, I told you, was supposed to have been discovered by Isaac Newton, not by Leonard Euler, who's a Swiss German mathematician who was credited with it, but he was not credited with the discovery. They somehow just gave the name to him. Well, his name Euler means in German owl. And an owl is a unique animal in that it's the only animal that can turn its head on its axis 271.8 degrees <laughs> Damn. That's crazy. It's a simulation. <laughs> That's the, the It's synopsis. the best mnemonic of all time, right? Yeah. Euler means owl. Oh, 271.8 <laughs> degrees. That's how far the owl can turn its head. Approximately 272 degrees. Pretty epic. <sighs> Man. <laughs> this, this, the synopsis of this whole podcast is it's a simulation. Because it's like the the... It's not just the intellectual understanding of all this. It's seeing how intelligently designed the reality is all around us. Real quick, because there's a couple of things I want to jump into real quick. But what, from your understanding, is the purpose of the pyramids? Because I my my study through like the Melchizedek lineage, I have some understanding of what I feel like it maybe was used for. But from your understanding, I'd be curious to hear what what was the purpose at the time, the energetic signature of the pyramids being created. What was that for? So since you mentioned Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is someone that throughout history, first of all, this is the fellow in the Bible in Genesis that Abraham paid tithes to. You don't know much about him. We know his name um, you know, comes from the root Hebrew word Malki, right? Which in uh, like Indian or Pakistan, they, they refer to as Malik. And in Hebrew, the word king is Malik also. Like Melek Hashem means like, uh, you know, king of... Of, of earth, right? King of uh, Melek Hashem Aolam, right? Of, of, of the world, right? So you could say like king of kings. And Malki Tzedek, Tzedek means like justice or peace. Malki Tzedek is like king of justice or peace. So who was this Melchizedek? Because there's not much written about him in the Old Testament. Um, it's referred to as the keys of Melchizedek that there are certain keys granted of wisdom and knowledge, hidden esoteric knowledge, to Melchizedek. Who else besides Melchizedek had such keys? Solomon. Solomon, the keys of Solomon. You've probably heard of the seal of Solomon. And they all have sigils too. They'll have their own sigil. 
So the, the sigil of Melchizedek or the seal of Melchizedek looks like a, an octagonal shape, right? And, and that immediately alerts you because you're like, wait a minute, that's interesting because um, Metatron and Mercury and Thoth also have a lot of symbology related to the number eight. The number of days in the Mercury year is 88 days. So eight and eight is often associated with Thoth or Mercury. You may have heard that before. Eight is also associated with abundance. 888 is Christ consciousness. So interestingly, you start noticing there's several other people that, that have these kinds of keys granted them, this extra wisdom or something. One was Enoch, another person with the name like Eno or Neo, mm. right? And, and so you've got Enoch, who many believe was the human form of Metatron, right? You have Melchizedek, who many believe is one of the incarnations of Thoth and Metatron on earth. You have Solomon, who many believe was likewise the same, right? Uh, Saint Germain. There are many people throughout history, and usually the, those people are associated with having access to certain keys. The key is the wisdom of understanding relative to the Great Pyramid, the mystery of it. The Great Pyramid, I believe, is a reflection of our conscious progression. So we know already that the Vitruvian man, when we overlaid the Vitruvian man, because of this proportion of this one square and one circle as well, we could figure out that if we overlay the pyramid within it in exactly the right way, all the chambers match up with the horizontal lines that da Vinci drew on the Vitruvian man's torso and knees as well. And so it posits then that maybe there are yet undiscovered chambers inside the Great Pyramid that represent, and these also happen to be exactly at chakra centers, right? So maybe the chambers represent the chakras. And this became the subject of a television show uh, that we have on, on streaming TV, on, on Amazon Prime and on Gaia, right, called Codex. It's done really well. I just had dinner with the CEO of Gaia last week, and he told me it's done very, very well. But the, the thing about this then is it says that this is a map, right? And then we found that da Vinci did go to Egypt for three years. Uh, we found the reference to it. He actually wrote all about it. Hmm. Um, and it was found in Codex Atlanticus, but, but often dismissed as being fictional. Da Vinci never wrote fiction. He wasn't writing, he wasn't a fiction novelist, so why would he write fiction in this particular case? It was a letter he wrote to the Devadar of the Sultan, or the Lieutenant Devadar of the Sultan of Cairo, who he worked for. In an engineering capacity, nobody knows exactly what it was. There are many in Egyptology that believe that there was a map to the Great Pyramid, to the inner structures of the Great Pyramid. Now, there have been Many new structures recently, so we know there's a big void space around where the throat chakra line is. Um, that was found in 2017 using the Muon scan. And there have been more recent Muon scans done by a Japanese delegation that have now called out 20 new structures and three new chambers inside the Great Pyramid that we didn't know about before. So you could say that as we lift our consciousness, more of our chakras open up. And as these chakras open up, more will be understood and revealed related to the Great Pyramid. The, the Great Pyramid, and what I discovered in there, and it's the subject of the show on Gaia, is the walls are literally covered in petroglyphs in the King's Chamber. Not only the King's Chamber, but also the Queen's Chamber. The first time I went there, I didn't notice any of it. I didn't see it. Second time I went in 2018... I was drawing in my notebook Alpha Omega the entire trip while I was in Israel the week before, and then I went to Egypt. And on the flight to Egypt, and I brought like 12 of my friends with me as well, I knew that I was going to discover something. I didn't know what it was, but I kept drawing my notebook. I was telling everybody, I'm like, I'm going to discover something. I'm going to discover something. I know I'm going to discover something. And I was drawing my notebook this Alpha Omega and the sacred geometric form of Alpha Omega. And as I got into the Great Pyramid, I was standing over the sarcophagus and one of my friends was laying in it and I was helping them find the pitch to resonate the chamber because it really goes loud. It's wah, 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 like super loud. Have you ever done it before? Mm -mm. You have to do it. It's next level stuff. Mm. And so I was standing above it and I had a memory flashback. 
of seeing some green light, a greenish blue light, melting or pressing alpha omega into the rim of the sarcophagus. And me standing in the same spot that I was in and knowing exactly where to look. And then I looked at that exact spot and there was alpha omega right on the rim. And I knew enough about the pyramid to know there's no writing in there other than there's like graffiti on the walls and everything. But this is like clearly pressed and, and this is dollarite. You can't chip this stuff. If I had a hammer and a chisel, you could never do it. The whole thing would crack. It's the most brittle stone, almost the most brittle stone on the entire planet. It's made of 55% quartz crystal. So if I took a hammer and chisel to quartz, you know what happens, it shatters. So I looked down at this thing and I was like, Wow, and I remembered it. And that was the first time that I had like a past life memory or something. And I, re I remembered seeing the other people in the room. There were like five other people in the room. They were not the same people. I was like transported exactly to that moment in time. And then I looked down exactly where I saw the pressing into the stone of the Alpha Omega and other stuff on the backside of the sarcophagus. And it's exactly where it was. And now you could see it. And the archaeologists that were there, they were like, did you do this? And I'm like, no, I didn't do this. I'm like, yeah, I just chipped it out just now. Please, it's not <laughs> happening. I'm like, give me a break. And it's 5.6 inches wide, which is exactly the 5.605 inches, which is the square root of 31.4159, which is pi times 10, which is the perimeter of the room in meters. So that was kind of interesting to me as well. So I started... On my next trip back, I started looking at the subtle details on the walls. And I, and I started thinking, well, if I raise my consciousness and I increase my ability to pattern recognize, will I see something entirely different? And, and I'd been studying and working hard and everything on using that method I talked about with being able to see more and more geometric forms and then testing myself of being able to see 80, 90, 100 geometric forms, right? Maybe even more. Maybe we could rank order our level of ascension and intelligence, quote unquote, access to higher knowledge by how many of these things we can actually see, how many we can train ourselves to see. And then also maybe by our understanding of the number of mathematical constants we know, because those are the verbs of the universal language. And we're walking around only understanding 10 or something. And yet there's many, many, many more. So you could almost rank order our ascension by our ability to recognize those aspects. It's a different way of looking at mathematics. Mathematics is no longer this nameless, faceless thing. It's you. You are the mathematics. It is the coherence of consciousness. It is just the language of thought. That's all that it is. Even at our basic form of our DNA. I, I filed patents 10 years ago on discovery of a binary code that is literally the basis of your DNA. Adenine plus thymine, guanine, cytosine, and the, the sulfur that goes in the phosphate backbone of DNA. Those are forming hexapentacus, pentagon hexagonal arrangements. So each nucleotide pair is one pentagon and then a hexagon connecting to another hexagon. That becomes a nucleotide pair. It's literally the shape of it. So hexapentacus is what it is. So, and then when you start adding up the number of nature's counting system, which is the number of electrons or protons, and, and in the carbon family, which is what all of our bodies are built out of, you know, we are made up of only hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. That's it. There's nothing else, right? And when you add up the number of protons and electrons, or, or electrons, you could do either one because they're the same, they're, they're stable elements. You end up with digital root values that come to one or zero. Actually, they all add up to zero until you go through transfer RNA, which is the process of creation of DNA. And then uracil replaces thymine, and then it goes to ones. So now you have the differentiation of ones and zeros. It's literally self-correcting code. It's kind of amazing. So our DNA is a binary code, like computer language. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And it's proven. So the point is that when I started noticing the walls on my second trip, or my third trip, I guess, 
to Egypt and I had 50 or so people with me, I started looking at more detail and then other people in the room who had also been committing themselves to this type of exercise of conscious raising effort started noticing patterns and petroglyphs on the walls that are telling a story. And the story is the story of Osiris. The story is the story of death, burial, and resurrection of Osiris through his many lifetimes of incarnations. On one wall is a bull and a cow, which represent Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega are letters that are predating anything we can think of in Egypt. They're everywhere in Egypt also, but they're not Greek. Everyone thinks, you know, I keep reading this stuff. It's like some guy said this morning, he's like, the Greeks stole it from the Egyptians. Okay, well, <laughs> um, first of all, if you keep thinking that everything's going to be stolen from you, what did I just say? More will be stolen from you. Whatever you judge will only come back to you more and more and more. So stop the judging. Stop believing that something's going to be stolen from you. That's how you arrest the process of things getting stolen from you, right? So when you look at it, actually, the symbol on the Arcturian mothership, which is called Athena, is an Alpha Chi Omega. Where is that Arcturian mothership? It's it's in the solar system. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So I took a turn for you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, what? 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 Just casual drop Just in. Just casual drop in on that. on the Arcturian mm -hmm. mothership. Okay. So what are Arcturians? Arcturians are just future humans. Yeah. They're literally future humans. My first experience with them was when I was 11 years old. And I lived in a forest called Rendlesham Forest in England. And they came and famously made a visit there. And it was the week right before New Year's. It was, like, it was on Boxing Day, I remember. And on the 28th as well. And there's all of it's been released, this information, because they, they were on the edge of a military base called Brentwater. And, um, and a guy famously touched the surface of, of the ship that they found. And he was a, a guy named Jim Penniston. And he got a binary download. And he wrote it all down as part of the record of it. And it turns out that that download that he got is the most accurate form of what we know of the fine structure constant, which separates light from darkness. And it's exactly the same number that we placed when Carl Sagan decided to send the Voyager into outer space. The one thing we could communicate to the rest of the world on who we are and our level of intelligence was our knowledge of the fine structure constant. So we have on there 1 over 137, which is this value, which is 0.00729735. Um, and Penniston's, every year they get a more accurate version of the fine structure constant, and every year his version of it from 1980 is correct, more and more. So it's kind of a fascinating story. That's, that's a whole other rabbit hole you can go down. Kind of, Arcturians yeah. were uh, believed to have been the people that helped build the pyramids with the Atlanteans, so they worked along with the Atlanteans. Um, and that this was all pre-dynastic. So we're talking about at least 12,800 yeah. years ago. Which is much longer than the perceived. Th much know. longer. Yeah. yeah. Though this Three is, times. when you go inside the pyramid, it looks super advanced. Yeah. It looks like it could be from the future as much as it is from the past. There's nothing about it that makes you go, this looks like some sort of decrepit old building. And there's, there are nine pyramids in Egypt that share this characteristic. So the Bent Pyramid shares this. You can tell they have very, very large stones. The Step Pyramid uh, has very small stones. And just like in Peru, uh, in Peru, if you go there, you could go to a place called Oliente Tambe, and there are sections of Oliente Tambe, which is this fantastic place. You look over this ravine, and you can see a jaguar carved into the mountain. You can see a man's face carved into the mountain. It's like really epic, like huge stuff. And you're like, who did that? That's pretty <laughs> incredible. And they've got these sites there that have these gigantic blocks, like the pyramid, that are like 80-ton type things. And then they've got smaller blocks that they use to build on top of it. These are the people, the interlopers that came after, right? And they settled there. So there's something much older. So the oldest pyramids in Egypt, I believe, are the ones with the very, very large blocks. There are nine such pyramids. Uh, the three on the Giza Plateau, obviously, not including the smaller satellites that are around them. Um, the, the Bent Pyramid, uh, Lahoon Pyramid, the Maidun Pyramid, 
um, and, and a few others. But basically, those are the pyramids that, that have these very, very large size blocks. The scale is very different. So they must have used a very different method. And people ask me all the time, what about the concrete thing? Um, I watched that video. It was probably the most outlandish video I've ever seen on this topic, which was kind of sad in a way because I think it was trying to make a political statement. And there was one aspect of that I thought was good, the reference to the meter, that there was an understanding of the meter and it was related to the centimeter and a drop of water. But um, there's way too much evidence that says that the stones that were used um, in the Great Pyramid are not concrete blocks. They're, they're not. So uh, you can definitely tell. And the Tura limestone that was on the outside of it as well, which are also very large blocks, uh, are most definitely not concrete blocks. So I think that, um, you know, they had a thesis and they went with, went with it, but I, I don't think it's the, the correct one. But the, the Great Pyramid is an ascension device. Did it also do energy? Um, well, energy and information and ascension are all really the same thing. I and mean, we could make an argument that um, information is equivalent to energy because we have an equivalency in physics between mass, energy, and information. This is kind of well known. Uh, information theory is now believed to be going to be proved by Portsmouth University very soon in their experiment colliding um, a positron and electron to form a gamma photon burst and then measuring that difference in, in information and energy associated with it, they, they believe they're going to prove that information is a state of matter. And what would, that ge what would that information be coming in the form of? Geometry. Geometry. So think of a realm of forms that's like an etheric realm of forms that can be brought into matter and it can be instantly rendered into form right? Like a rendering, a very rapid rendering. And maybe that rendering has a benefit of a limit that we have on our perception so that our perception never exceeds the speed of light. So it's time to render yeah. and we can't perceive it. It's kind of an interesting concept, right? Until that rendering is completed and it takes the speed of light to complete the rendering. You know, the latest Nobel Prize just basically proved that what we call the universe and local realism as a term scientifically is false. I don't know if you saw that. It was on the cover of, uh, of the Scientific American, which basically shows that the latest Nobel Prize, which proved a, an experiment in quantum entanglement, now not only suggests but proves that local realism is false. That means if something is not observed... It doesn't have a position. Hmm. And not having a position means it's not there. So it goes back to the old question. If a, a tree falls in the forest, did it ever happen if nobody ever observed it, right? Yeah. Or is the moon there if it is not observed by anyone? This is a bigger, deeper question. <laughs> yeah. But this is the realm in which the world has now found itself at the mainstream level of science. This is not fringe stuff anymore, right? Yeah. What this is basically saying is that Niels Bohr and his approach to the world was arguably more correct than the approach that was taken by Einstein. Not that everything Einstein said was wrong. It's not. I mean, most of the stuff he said was absolutely right. I think he was beyond a genius. Uh, the best thing he said I love is the one he says, you can't, if you try to judge a fish by its ability to climb trees, right, then obviously mm -hmm. we should never be disappointed in the fact mm -hmm. that they Mm -hmm. They're not they're not stupid, right? <laughs> because they can't climb a tree. They're not built to, to climb the tree. Mm -hmm. But I believe the Great Pyramid is there as a totem in in some form for us to see our level of conscious expansion. And that during our lifetimes, more and more will continue to be revealed as we raise our own consciousness collectively. It represents the ascension of man. Did it also generate energy? Well, clearly it generates information. So yes, it probably did generate energy. Was that its main purpose? No, I don't believe so. I believe the main purpose of the Great Pyramid, there was never a mummy inside that sarcophagus. That is an ascension device that all of us at some stage, if you can, should go and lay in, just as Thoth says in the Emerald Tablets. 
lay in my sarcophagus and I will reveal to you the mysteries. It's, it's there. And I, I can tell you the week after I laid in the sarcophagus in 2018 is when I discovered the prime number pattern, which is not supposed to have a pattern. Mm. And I could then use that pattern to predict primeness infinitely. And I published that at, uh, on Cornell's website. Right, which went through an academic review process and everything. So the, the point is it stops short of peer review. Peer review is a little different story because you, then you get into all the politics. But in order to get things published on that Cornell site, which is called archive.org, you have to go through an academic review nonetheless. And I published a few papers there now. But it's, it's interesting because if you think about the Great Pyramid as having this perfect balance of masculine feminine, and heart brain. And it matches perfectly the intersections of Metatron's cube, which then requires no measurement to build it. Right? The perfect architecture. Even the Greeks would say, wow, that's epic. Then you've got a case for an ascension story for mankind. And the the walls, the petroglyphs on the walls telling the story of the bull and the cow, the sun to the bull that sacrifices itself for its mother, the cow, to merge back into Hathor, right? So this is Apis and Hathor. Mm. The name of the Great Pyramid anciently was Bull Mountain. So not surprising that on the north wall and the north side is the entrance of the Great Pyramid. And on that north wall in the king's chamber is the bull and the cow. And my wife Susie discovered that. And you can see it. And now you can't unsee it. Once you see it, you're like, oh, my gosh. It's, like, so obvious. And it looks kind of like the cave paintings that you see in France. But they're etched into the wall with some sort of etching technology. There's a bird and a phoenix above them. There's a tree of life that they're pointing towards. They're facing west because Osiris was the god of the great bull of the west. From the west, not from Egypt. It's another part of the story in the myth. Then on the other side, facing opposite to the sarcophagus, you have uh, a scene which is Artemis, or Satet is the Egyptian name of this goddess. They all have the same concepts. They're all just different names, from Samaria to Egypt pantheon to the Greek pantheon to the Roman pantheon. They're all the same stories, Mm -hmm. right? It's kind of remarkable. And when you look at that wall, you see her riding a stag and shooting an arrow at a gigantic bird which is an eagle, which also represents the um, Scorpio. So Scorpio was not scorpion. It was a snake in astrology. Also, it became scorpion as well. But it's the one sign in the zodiac that goes through several sages uh, to its resurrection stage, which is the phoenix. So as a thunderbird, is a giant eagle, right? That's the stage that you achieve after you have gotten through the snake stage, right? You become a bird as a Scorpio, and then Scorpio then becomes from a bird eagle to a phoenix. That's why there's a phoenix and a Bennu bird on the other wall. So it's basically showing you the cycle. But in the story, Artemis, Satet, falls in love with Orion, who was Osiris, and uh, her brother, twin brother, Apollo, says, oh, you're not a very good archer. You can't hit that thing swimming off in the distance there that she didn't know what it was because she was in love with it so she couldn't see what it was and she got fooled by her brother to shooting her arrow and she kills Orion. So on the wall, you can literally see her shooting the arrow into the Thunderbird, which is the shadow of Orion, right, before it becomes the Phoenix stage because it was all the negative aspects. The thing that Apollo didn't like about Orion, he was very boastful. Right. And this was sort of his shadow aspect. So that's one of the scenes on the walls. And it's right next to the Pleiades, also on the wall. And then on the other wall, uh, that's the opposite of the bull and the cow and the, and the birds and the tree of life, is a water scene. So the entire wall is water scene. Now, the way we found all of this is all the same pictures, pictographs, were hidden inside of The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Which is where I wanted to go next. So we matched them. All of these things, the bull and the cow, the birds on the wall and everything, they're all hidden into the Last Supper as well. And when you look, you can see them. So this was 
fascinating for us because we were like, what the? And then you notice that the, the pediment above Jesus in the Last Supper and where they're sitting at the table, underneath the table is this box-shaped thing that's the top of a door in Milan, which is the same shape as a sarcophagus. And then above Jesus in the pediment is an eye shape for the eye of Ra. It's like, uh, this is a little too weird, <laughs> right? And then you, so you start connecting all the dots and you're like, oh, the proportions of the room match perfectly the proportions of the Last Supper. Kind of fascinating. Yeah. How, how do you feel Leonardo da Vinci as an individual, as a human being, was able and like, how was he capable of such encryptions? And why was it necessary for the for the that information to be encrypted so i believe i mean we could take the period and you know this is the same time frame roughly as giordano bruno right who got burned at the stake so mm -hmm. you didn't want to like anger the vatican when i first discovered the prime number pattern i got two invitations one was to go visit with the dalai lama because if there's a pattern that it assumes some sort of creator Right? So right. it's got spiritual implications now. So I got to go meet with the Dalai Lama, and I went to his palace in Dharamsala, and I brought a scientific delegation with me, but I led it. And uh, it was one of the coolest experiences ever. And I spent five and a half hours teaching Dalai Lama math and physics. I mean, it was kind of cool. And Nisim Haramine came with me, and so did six other people, five other people. But the other invitation I got was to the Vatican. And there I got to talk about the prime number pattern uh, at this conference um, and just talked about the discovery, which turned out that it makes the shape of a cross. That's the thing. The pattern is the shape of a Templar cross, not just any cross, but a Templar cross. And if you don't know about the Knights Templar, you can find a lot about Knights Templar. But basically, um, there's clearly deeper meaning and, and there's probably some hidden meaning in this. Now, Leonardo da Vinci was a Rosicrucian. Now, the term Rosicrucianism comes from the term Rose Cross. So what is the Rose Cross? Well, the Giza Plateau's ancient name was Rose Cross. It was pronounced Rose Tau. Tau is the letter T, and that was the cross. Mm. So Ross Tau is the original name of the Giza Plateau. And it was right across from Memphis, which is what we now call Cairo. But Cairo, and often synonymous with the letter T, is the letter X. Right? So Tauro, bull, mm -hmm. Taurus, yeah. would be the original name of Cairo, but now replaced with Kai becomes Cairo, which still also still means bull. So da Vinci refers to, uh, in his letter to the Lieutenant Devadar that I mentioned earlier, of the Sultan of Cairo, he talks about the great Taurus mountain. Now, people think that that is a reference to Mount Ararat between... Armenia, and, um, and Turkey today. It, it's not. There, there is no, he talks about living in a town called Kalindra, which means calendar, time. Hmm. And that he's looking at this great Mount Taurus and that he goes inside Mount Taurus into this big open cavern on the inside of it, which I believe was the king's chamber. And he describes it and it's exactly the experience you have going into the king's chamber. And it's an abject detail too. It's pretty amazing. But the whole thing is encrypted because he says it's Mount Taurus. Well, Mount Taurus is Bull Mountain. That's the name of the Great Pyramid. Yeah. Right? The symbols in hieroglyphics for the Great Pyramid is a bull and two chevrons that are the shape of mountains. Right. That's basically what it means, Bull Mountain. So, And he says he was looking at it from Kalindra, this town, which I believe that Kalindra is actually the Kali Dragon. Kali Dragon Calendar. Kalindra, Kali Dra, right? So Dragos also. So what is the Kalindra? Kalindra is the Ouroboros, right? Mm -hmm. The cycle of time. So the Kalindra is actually where the Sphinx is. The Sphinx is the hand of a clock, right? And this clock is actually a 26,000 year clock. If you account for time dilation, because as we get closer to Sirius A, that's our sister star with the sun, then time changes, right? And so what really happens is you end up with a shorter cycle. It goes by faster. 
right, as, as the gravity increases as we get closer to Sirius, which is 8.6 light years from us now. But for the next you know, 13,000 years, we're going to be in the cycle of proximity to Sirius A, which we've actually been far away from it. So we've been at a distance from it. This is our sister sun. And, and it's you know, 10 times larger than the sun. It's a whiter color as well. And it also has a dwarf star next to it, the brown dwarf, the Sirius B. Mm -hmm. This is a cycle for us to go through that lasts, if you look at it not accounting for the time dilation, uh, you end up with a 25,920 year cycle. If you account for the time dilation, it's right on 24,000 years. This is exactly as Shirak Teshra and several other Vedic mathematicians have said that the cycle of our time is 24,000 years. And I believe that. Mm. Throughout history, mathematicians have actually been the spiritualists. That's what Vedic mathematicians are. And they knew how to interpolate astrology and numerology to be able to read what is coming and what's happening in the world. The, the television show on Apple TV called Foundation is all about this. This guy named Harry Sheldon, who's a mathematician who predicts the calamity of the next 12,000 years. And so he has to go and tell all the people, guess what, guys, we're all going to die. <laughs> and before we die, we need to capture all the information in our civilization and embed it and compress the data into one geometric structure called a cuboctahedron. Have you seen the show? I, uh, I it's an Isaac it. Asimov show, right? Art imitates life. So he compressed all of it into the ratios of this cuboctahedral structure, which is a method because geometry is a natural compression of data. Mm. Because you can have any ratio inside of it. That means you can have any data set inside of it. So what if this is not really just fiction? Maybe as part of this story in this simulation, 12,000 years ago, they figured this out and said, how do we encrypt all of this knowledge and wisdom into one structure that people will be able to discover layer by layer of to awaken humanity? And let's embed all of this knowledge and wisdom like onion layers, right, into a geometric structure that is the Great Pyramid. Hmm. So it doesn't get lost like when the periods of humanity go through those Kali Yugas or like the Golden Ages that the information then can be stored in ways that will always be there if the individuals know how to have access to it or if the consciousness of the species gets to a point where it becomes accessible for, for more people. But so that it's not lost and that information and wisdom can carry on. Right. It's survived through many, many earthquakes. And it's a regular structure of how it's built is perfectly regular, which allows it to be uh, totally impervious to many earthquakes. Its, its center point is still within one quarter inch of perfection today, which you can't find that on your house. It's yeah. 10 years old, right? right. It's, it's not going to happen. So, you know, there's an old saying, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. <laughs> and, and I think that is true. So I believe that the pyramids are housing all of this esoteric knowledge, these keys of information that were built into it so that humanity, when it awakens and it goes through this cycle as we get closer to Sirius A and as we start to expand consciousness and transcend duality, which is an artifact of the Piscean age, then we'll be able to crawl out of the ashes of that duality, hmm. which is exactly what the thesis was in the television show Foundation. Yeah. They just put it in a cube octahedron instead of putting it into this modified octahedron that we call a pyramid. Yeah. And so da Vinci was just living in a time where he had access to within himself. He was a being that came in and was able to encrypt these things. And for, for individuals that haven't seen Codex, I highly recommend checking it out because you see all the ways, all the various different mind-blowing encryptions through the Last Supper, through the Vitruvian Man, through... Um, Even Mona Lisa, Mona as Lisa well as Salvador uh, Mundi. Salvador Mundi. Yeah. They're all in there. So yeah. every painting that he did after uh, 1486 are all encrypted with knowledge, esoteric wisdom of Egypt. They all include some reference to the angular slope of the Great Pyramid, which is solving the problem of squaring the circle. Yeah. And um, 
we can prove the authorship even of the Salvatore Mundi because the same encryptions, I mean, the X on the, on the garment of Jesus in the Salvatore Mundi is exactly the heiress edge of the Great Pyramid. And if you look at the bandwidth of the embroidery, it's precisely, if you take an account for that and then just crisscross that bandwidth to the peak, right, that comes out to exactly the 51, 85, 36 degrees. It's the same thing. So it just keeps up showing up over and over and over again in so many different forms. And I think what da Vinci did, I think he had a map. I think that the Sultan Kate Bay gave him access to this map and that um, this map was the same one that Khalid al-Mamun probably had access to in the ninth century when he broke into the pyramid because it makes no sense that he bored in. Lots of people tried to get in a different place. I mean, Napoleon blew out part of the pyramid too. He spent the night there. In fact, after he spent the night there, it totally changed him. He became a mathematician after that. Do you know that? Mm -mm. Do you know Napoleon actually has a mathematical and geometric constant and theorem to his name? No. It's called the Bonaparte constant or the Napoleon Bonaparte constant. And it's referencing a relationship to triangles. He, after he went there, you know, he went to Palestine, he conquered, right, conquered Egypt and everything, spent the night in the pyramid. And afterwards, he's like, I don't think I want to do this so much anymore. This conquering thing's kind of for the birds. And the problem is he was so good at conquering. When he went home, everyone was like, you got to keep conquering, make us all richer. And he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do more science pursuit and stuff like this. And they're like, he's no good for us anymore. <laughs> so they sent him off to this island, right? Uh, it was, uh, he, he died, uh, I think it was, he went to first to Helena, and then he went to Elba, right? But between, he came back and attacked, right? And, and he had such loyalty among the ranks, even the French army, when they confronted him after he landed, on the, at the coast and, and started to make his ascent up to Paris, they stopped him and the army was like, okay, we're going to kill you. There were guns drawn and everything. He says, come back to Papa, guys, because he was their boss before and they all just came running back to him. So then he started building this army on the way there. But, you know, it only lasted for 100 days. And then he was thrown, you know, back and he found out that he had stomach cancer as well. And, and the rest of the story is quite sad. But Alexander the Great, and Julius Caesar spent the night in the Great Pyramid, and it was the beginning of the end for all three of them. Hmm. Because something about them changed. There was a lot of the people that were benefiting by their conquering, and they didn't really want to conquer anymore. So something shifted in their conscious awareness. Yeah. And they were the greatest conquerors of all time. Alexander, not long after, um, you know, tried to conquer all the way into India, but he failed, right? Effectively, he only got to a certain point and then he got badly injured and then he ended up dying in Cairo, right? Died in Egypt. And what he had called Babylon, right? And that actually showed up because the letter Da Vinci wrote was to the Lieutenant Devadar of the Sultan of Babylon, Cairo. So there's a section inside of uh, Cairo today, which is also this Calindra place, where there's a place called Babylon. And Babylon is on this little island. It's a citadel that points towards the Great Pyramid and the Giza complex. So all of this has been part of our research and study. And I think that da Vinci had access to all of this, uh, and he encrypted it in all of his paintings, uh, including La Belle Ferronnière, um, John the Baptist. All of this is encrypted across. So no one ever considered that da Vinci had one encryption that was a mosaic across a tapestry of all of his works from a certain time period onward. But he was very much into geometry. He wrote the book. He did all the illustrations for the book Divine, Divine Proportion with Luca Pacioli, which is the treatise on geometry and has been for the last several hundreds of years. And um, I think he understood and had this higher awareness and consciousness, and that's why he was able to tap into this higher genius of who he was. And I think also he was someone who was finding his own encryptions from himself in his prior lifetimes also, and yeah. maybe future as well. Yeah. Uh, also, real quick, just because we're talking about individuals that have ad had access to a different level of genius, Edgar, Edgar Cayce, and because we also brought up the Sphinx, under the left, left paw of the Sphinx yeah. says... Mm -hmm. You know, for those that, that, that don't know, uh, Edgar Casey's an American clairvoyant and the psychic. Sleeping prophet. 
Mm. And has given many like prophetic visions and mm-hmm. sites, uh, one of which was the Hall of Records under the left paw of the Sphinx. Have there been scans to see if there is? Yeah, a- we know that there's chambers down there. Uh, there was a scan performed, I think it was in the early 90s. Uh, it was done by a group that was associated with Robert Schock. He told me about it. And um, they know that there is a chamber, a complex series, a complex of chambers that are underneath the Sphinx and particularly under the left paw. We also know that the... So if you look at Salvatore Mundi, Salvatore Mundi is holding this glass crystal orb, ball, crystal right? ball, right? Well, there's three dots inside of it that one of them is shaped like a heart even. Mm-hmm. And you can see the shadow of his hand is also peeking through. It's not really a shadow. You just see his hand through right. the ball. It's the shape of the pyramid. Mm. Now, the three stars actually match two constellations. They match the, the head, the neck, and the mouth stars of Leo constellation, where there is, in fact, an alpha and an omega Leonis. So there's alpha Leonis, which is Regulus, the heart, the heart of the lion. In French, it's the Cour de Lion. And there's an Omega Leonis, and that Omega Leonis, when you look at it in the night sky, it turns out to be right on the left paw. So then where's the X that marks the spot? Where's the Chi? Right? So there should be something between the heart and the left paw, which is about where the stela is, right? Which is also where it's believed that there is an entrance near that place, that part of the structure, to get into the lower chambers underneath the left paw. That we know are there that were found with ground penetrating radar. So that, that's number one. Uh, number two is that the other constellation that matches this are the three upper stars of, uh, of Orion. So those three stars include uh, Bellatrix and Betelgeuse, which you've probably heard of. So it would be the shoulder and head star of Orion, right? And they match perfectly this. Now, we already know that the Giza Plateau is aligned from Robert Boval's work to the... Uh, the Giza Plateau is matching the three stars of the belt of Orion, right? So that's interesting, right? So the, those, those stars are, and Mintaka, I guess, would be the Great Pyramid uh, in that as a reflection looking at it against the night sky. But then you've also got um, the fact that Orion's head is matching this, and so then you could place the rest of Orion on top of the Giza Plateau, and you've got his hand peeking through the shape of the pyramid. Again, another encryption trying to point us towards Christ consciousness is through this doorway or portal, this reflection of our consciousness that is the Great Pyramid. And it's the story of this Osiris. And Orion is that story, right? Orion is the other name, I guess you could say, of of, uh, the constellation. When the Egyptians look at the night sky, they look at what we call Orion and call that Osiris. So it's the same story. Yeah, And I think that's what these layers that we're peeling back to understand it more and more will end up revealing more and more relative to it. I talked to the chief scientific officer of NASA and we talked about getting a, um, you know, NASA has this optical coherence tomography device, which I actually played a hand in helping develop when I worked at a company called Coherent uh, almost 30 years ago and in the late 90s. And this technology is used to measure the thickness of retinas without having to cut into someone's eye, which mm. is important to know for things like glaucoma and the pressure on the yeah. optic nerve and, and also what kind of damage you might have with macular edema or age-related macular degeneration. And this technology has now been modified to scan planets. So optical coherence tomography can be used in place of ground-penetrating radar mm. to be able to see what's inside of the Great Pyramid and they put it in a drone, so it doesn't even have to damage anything. Well, pretty epic, that's right? That's crazy, yeah. So the the guy uh, from from NASA that I was talking with was like, "Oh yeah," and it's funny because he happened to be when I was talking on the phone with him. Another synchronicity, he was leading a new project to take this drone to Venus. Right now, you know that Apollo, the god of the sun, was the moon mission that visited the moon. It was like two months before I was born. Um you know, or rather two months after I was born and in 1969. And so now we have another moon mission going back, which is called Artemis, which of course is the sister of Apollo. And we had the eagle is landing, which is the Scorpio. Same story, right? And then we left the moon. We never went back since 1972. 
kind of interesting, right? Yeah. It's kind of a funny part of this, you know, matrixy kind of story. And um, and so today we're now going back with Artemis, which is kind of like that's pretty funny because Artemis represents the moon and its rise of the feminine. See, the same type of stories are coming out. Well, it happens that this fellow who is chief scientific officer at NASA, um, he Jim Garber is his name. He basically is leading the next mission to go and scan Venus with optical coherence tomography in this drone. So they're going to deploy a drone close to, you know, in the atmosphere of, of Venus, of course, Venus being the goddess of love, right? And it's a very hot planet for us. But what's more interesting about it is guess what the name of the mission is? Hmm. The Leonardo da Vinci mission mm -hmm. to the planet of love. <laughs> Dang. Mm -hmm. That's a trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and you can look all this stuff up online. Yeah. You can find it all. So you could sit here and say, oh, this is all just coincidence. Right. Or you can wake up and smell the, the green tea <laughs> and, and say, wait a minute, it's a simulation. <laughs> yeah, I think there's part of, even, you know, within my own mind where I tend to lean towards being more skeptical off of, you know, seeing all the ways in which people need feel the urge to create a belief system around something they simply can't know and mm -hmm. like needing to attach a meaning mm -hmm. and attachment to to certain things. And then there comes a certain point where there's just like so much evidence where it's just like, hello, there's clearly something here. You know, you know it's pretty funny. So if you look at the math, okay, I'll give you one. The, I, I'll throw one math thing out there for you. It's kind of a mind blower. So in... In mathematics, we use these constants that are tied to Greek letters, right? So I mentioned the fine structure constant. And the fine structure constant um, is uh, 1 over 137. So this happens to be a number that is unique because it creates a double mirror. So what do I mean by double mirror? There are three pairs of double mirror numbers, and they're not more than this. Mm -hmm. So the double mirror numbers include... 137 and 73, because 1 over 137 equals 0 0.0073, right? So it rounds to it. It's very, very close, 729735. So you got 73 and 137. So its palindrome, which is it's just backwards representation, is equal to the same numerical string as its um, reciprocal value, the inverse of it. And I mentioned already the importance of this 1 over x thing and x which represents the absorption and reflection of the same thing, right? So the other numbers that do this are 57.1 and 175. So 1 over 57.1 is going to give you 0 0.0175. And 57.1 is its palindrome, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And what separates these numbers, so if I took 137 and divide it by 57.1, is 2.4. And 2.4 is the other number pair that does this too. So 1 over 24 equals 0 0.042, right? So it rounds. It's actually 416666. Mm -hmm. So there's only three pairs of numbers that do this. Now, it just so happens that one of them is named alpha. The alpha constant is 0 0.0073. So there's your 73, right? And 1 over 137. The omega constant is 57.1 through a compass conversion. It's actually 0.56714, but if you convert, you know, 56 degrees, 71.4 minutes, it comes out to exactly 57.1, right, in decimal conversion. So you have to make between scalar and transverse wave conversions, you have to go to compass values. So mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, that's in a base 60 system. So it's the same number. So now you have 57.1 is the omega constant. That's kind of interesting. So then what's the one in between? The chi, yeah. right? Which is the 24th letter of the English alphabet is X, mm. right? And it also can be tav, aleph tav in Hebrew, right? The last letter of the alphabet was the chi or the tav. It was the same shape, right? So what if we do the math? What if we multiply those numbers together? Alpha, chi, omega. And we apply for that 0.73, right, for the, so we use a 73, 
And then we multiply that by 2.4, which is the 24 of the chi. And then we multiply that by 0.571. What does the result come out to? So now I've just taken the real values for alpha and omega in mathematics. This is a real mathematical yeah, constants. Yeah. Just made a compass conversion on one of them. That's it. Base 60 conversion. That's it. And you can use a calculator for that as well. And then took the differential between those two, which turns out to be 24. And the 24th letter of the alphabet is X. Guess what it comes out to? 1.000. Alpha chi omega is an equation that equals one. Really? <laughs> Insane. Insane. It's like, I don't even know how to comprehend the depth and way in which the intelligence is just so uh, inherent within everything it's and beautiful. everyone. Yeah, so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's like when I realized that yod heh vav -he, the Hebrew letters, also could be read as pi to the seventh power divided by pi times seven. And guess what it comes out to? Pi to the seventh power is 3,020 divided by pi times seven equals 22 equals 137. Separation, the energy... It's called the electron coupling constant. It is literally the thing that separates light from darkness and creates duality. When, when you put threshold energy into an electron, excite it, it will either jump, if the energy is high enough, right, it will emit a photon. And it has to be this threshold differential of 1 over 137. If it's underneath, then it will just absorb the photon and it'll jump to an outer shell, right, to another valence shell. That is called the electron coupling constant. It is the veritable separation of light from darkness. It's the most important constant in all of physics. In fact, if you look at the foundational basis of the Higgs boson, it is the alpha constant. Hmm. Just all coincidence. <laughs> I am the alpha and omega. Wild, man. Um, I have a couple quick, like, last rapid-fire questions. But before we do that, just because you mentioned it, and I can't not bring it back to your alien, your ET <laughs> enco encounters. <laughs> uh, just briefly, man, like, can you share a couple of your experiences or just, like, what, that, what that's been like? What, yeah, what, was it, what were those moments? Yeah, my first time was in 2017. Oh, no, my first time was when I was 11 years old in the 1980. Um, they came to the backyard and I went outside. I remember at the time I was digging a trench in my backyard that my dad had asked me to dig. And I was so worried about it getting done correctly. And it was funny because there was like a foreman there, an English guy. And I was, uh, I guess I was 11 years old. And uh, this, this guy, his name was Ginger, I remember. And he would he was kind of lazy or something. I don't know what it was, but he'd like watch me dig this trench. And I was working my butt off to dig this trench because we were gonna we were putting a footing in for a concrete wall, right? Retaining wall. And it had to be like four feet deep, but it was like maybe 75 to 100 feet long. And I remember going outside to go and check on my work. So I've always been a super hard worker. And I was like, okay, it's raining. I wanted to see if like mud had filled it in or something like that. And so I went outside. And when I was outside, then I saw some lights. And um, that was my first experience with this, you know, thing, Arcturians, right? Who, who just acted like regular people, except they were kind of blue-green colored. So you saw like the physical or like energetic resonance of like the being. They're more like you can say they have they they can become more solid, mm -hmm. but in general they're more like what we would consider like ghosts or spirits. Got it. Because they're six dimensional, at yeah. least these were. Some Arcturians can be fifth dimensional. And when you're six dimensional, you can transcend uh time space. Right? You can go in and out of things. So we've been trying to find things that are more three-dimensional things. Right. You're not going to find it because they can't travel through large distances. And, and, and so yeah. there's sort of rules within this simulation, right? Yeah. And as you raise consciousness, you could think of it like this. It's like 
if you start off as a grasshopper, you live in a field. Your universe is a field. That's your entire universe. And you don't have an expansion beyond that experience. You die and come back as a monkey in a forest. And now your flora and fauna has dramatically increased. And you know, you know what a sloth is. And you know, you know what giant spiders are. And you know what all these things that were never in the field that couldn't be supported by the ecosystem of the field. But now you've got more flowers, more everything. You die and you come back in Alabama, right? You never traveled anywhere. So Alabama and the town you live in is your world, right? You might be very colloquialized, right? You, you have a certain experience and that's your world. You've never traveled anywhere else. So you can't, you maybe have heard about it. You could be educated and everything, but maybe unless you've ever been there, you don't know how blue the sky is in Alaska other than what someone tells you it is. Right. And then you might die again and come back in some metropolitan city somewhere. You're well-traveled. You, you know that there are people in Japan, you know, that are called the, you know, the Inu. And these, these people are like very, very unique in Japan because they look Caucasian. Uh, or you might know that you might have met people in Russia you, that the guy in Alabama never would have met. And certainly the grasshopper would have never encountered, right? <laughs> And, and these people might as well be as foreign as an extraterrestrial life form to the grasshopper, the monkey, and the Alabama guy. Yeah. So these are all just stages. It's not like you transcend a, a dimension and leave that dimension. You're still within that dimension. It's just your perception within those dimensions change. And your experience, therefore, changes irrevocably. You can't shrink. Once your consciousness has been stretched, it can't shrink back to its former form. You will not, once you've seen something, you can't unsee something. It's the same kind of concept. Yeah. So this idea that, you know, as we expand consciousness, we will encounter more life forms is completely consistent with what I just said. We will experience more life forms. We'll be introduced to more experience as we up-level Right, and and that is the nature of how this whole thing works. My next time um, was in Egypt in 2017. I was um, right before I went into the king's chamber that day. I gave a presentation to this whole group of math people and physicists. They're all members of Resonance Foundation, and the seminar asked me to give a presentation on presenting my math as a language. So I gave a presentation on math as a language. And I, I'd never presented my stuff before because this is all stuff that I got by tapping into the Akashic field. Mm -hmm. That's how all information comes to us. You don't, the autodidactic path in some ways is easier to go down. Yes, I've had formal education and everything. I've been to universities and done all that stuff. But the work I've done in mathematics has all been like Ramanujan. You can tap into that field of knowledge. And... It's a function. If you want to get the highest level of science, scientific attainment, you have to do it through the doorway of the heart brain. You have to do it through the doorway of spirituality. That is the portal. You will be limited. That's the nature of this way this matrix is set up. You will be limited to the information you can access when you remain hyper-specialized and do not go down the spiritual path. You'll never be able to find the solutions that will be most vexing problems. Um, as soon as you turn to the spiritual aspect, then you can start to access these higher doorways. It's like this. Whenever I have a problem in math I'm trying to solve, I, sometimes I hit a brick wall, right? Everybody does. I yeah. was trying to work on a new type of mathematical compression, which I solved. But the way I solved it was through music. Sometimes I'll hit a wall in something I'm trying to solve uh, in physics, and then I don't focus on physics anymore, and I go into art. And I'll draw something. And then in the course of drawing it, that will unlock something else because I'm trying to get closer to the divine. By the way, this is the way it came for Kepler. This is the way it came for Da Vinci. This is the way it came for everybody throughout history that formed all of the knowledge bases that we have in all of our universities. They were all spiritualists, every single one. Statues will never be erected for pessimists, and they'll never be erected also in the history books of bringing new knowledge to this planet. 
And they'll never refer to themselves as pessimists. They'll call themselves realists right? without any judgment, right? Because we need that. The light needs the dark as much as the dark needs the light. That's the nature of it. That's why I'm happy to have a, wear a hat that says shadow worker. So Galactic Federation, <laughs> send me a shadow worker hat, please. I'll wear your Galactic Federation shirts though. But yeah, they, they came, the first experience I had was in that afternoon after I gave my presentation and it was a four hour lecture and everyone was crying at the end. More than half the people were crying because they felt like they had learned a new way of looking at mathematics. And this is the course I teach, um, which is etymology of number. So I turned it into a course series hmm. And it's now tens of thousands of people have taken this course and, and people really have loved it. And I, every year at Christmas, I do one of my courses just as a gift for free to everybody. And this, this year, um, I still have a few more days left on meditative geometry. So it's a course on how to draw Metatron's cube, all the geometric forms within it, and then some more advanced concepts as a 10-class series. But, uh, but etymology of number really teaches you to look at math differently and helps you interpolate what you're seeing and experiencing in the world around you every day, every moment of every day, and how you might see the world slightly differently and come up with entirely different experiences and outcomes just by changing your perception. When we change our perception, we change our world. When we change the way we see things, the things we see change. It's just a truism. And I believe that living here is about learning that truth is the sum of all possible perspectives. Truth is the sum of all possible perspectives. So trying to, that's why I love geometry, is it forces you to look, to find these connecting lines. First of all, it's predetermined. You know, we think that it's all random, right? No, it's not. If I draw two lines, the third line that would connect them is already predetermined. So think about that for a moment. In this context, one line plus one line equals three. It's not one plus one equals two because the entire existence around us is triangular. In a metaverse even, all metaverses are built on right triangle constructions. Every single thing you see fractal into right triangle constructions. But you don't need more than two lines to represent those right triangles. And that ratio defines the experience and the outcome, which is the hypotenuse. Two lines can define everything. It doesn't even have to be a right triangle. It could be any kind of triangle. You said that truth is the sum of all possible perspectives. If there's an infinite amount of possible perspectives, which I think we probably agree on there is, then is truth something that can ever be fully arrived at or is just ever expanding? I think it's ever expanding. I think that's why the universe expands. I think what we experience in the universe expansion is really the expansion of our own consciousness. It's the end of our, you know, if you looked at the known world, a hundred years ago, it was the galaxy. And then now it's this universe and there's trillions of galaxies. Mm. And it's constantly expanding as we push the boundary condition of entropy further and further away from us. That is the expansion of the universe. And we're just seeing it in visible form. Yeah. And it's expanding it near the speed of light. So it's like you can never say that you have truth more that you're with truth. Yeah, I think that, look, there are categories I think everything can be distilled down, but the higher dimensional experiences are all about these subtle differences. Yeah. It's being able to see pattern amid chaos, being able to extract simplicity from the highest degree of complexity. And the biggest problems that are most complex problems can only have simplistic solutions. Otherwise, they're not solutions. So this notion of being able to take a step back and say, okay, I maybe can't see all infinite possible perspectives, but I know that there is truth that could be categorized for the 360 degrees of the first layer of that truth. Right. That's where I try to strive for. How do I start to see things from you know, 60 perspectives? How do I start to see things, and I'm using base 60 for a reason, right? because that's how you look at circularity. Right? How do I start to see things from a 360 degree perspective? And then maybe on top of that, the next layer would be to take it to 21,600, which would be the number of minutes of a compass within 360 degrees. And then how do you take that to, you know, 1,296,000, which is the number of seconds of perspective within 360 degrees? Do you see what I'm saying? 
So it's, a, and, and probably when you are in your full divine form, right, as the one consciousness, then nothing is mystery to you than those infinite degrees of perception. But then you might say, well, then why? If God's <laughs> so omnipotent and so omnipresent and so, you know, um, omniscient, then why does he need to live in some simulation? What's the point? Well, I interviewed yesterday Aubrey Marcus, and I asked him the same question on my podcast. And his answer was, it's God pleasuring himself. I'm like, this is like God's masturbation. <laughs> that's pretty, that's epic. I'm sure it's a big explosion in the end. <laughs> but but the, the, it made me really think, because I, then I had to think myself, how would I answer this question? And the answer I would give to this question now after thinking about it is, God can comprehend it, but until you experience it, it's not real. The only reality we experience in this world are the emotions that come from our direct experiences. That's what's real to us. The emotions, the feelings, and the logos, which is the divine, had to feel. The logos has to feel pathos. It had to suffer. It had to create the differentiation to experience itself. It's through experiential learning that consciousness truly expands. It's not didactic. We can sit in a classroom all day long and teach ourselves for our own entertainment, our own pleasuring. But until we actually get our hands dirty and see what it's like to be burned at the stake, see what it's like to fall off of a building or to experience starvation or to experience all the travesties of the world through this extreme differential. You know, maybe Jesus, when he was on the cross, we think he may have been suffering, but he might have actually been in a moment of bliss. It's our judgment that limits us from being able to see all possible perspectives of truth. So, you know, I think that's the thing you've learned in life. Uh, it's like the one thing I've learned in life is that the more I've learned, the more I recognize, the less I actually know. <laughs> and, and I think that has been a wisdom path in general. That's what wisdom would say. I don't believe that we're here on earth to learn more judgment. The construct is judgment. Yeah. We're here to learn to transcend the construct. And the transcendence of judgment is just to learn how to love and how to be loved. So beautifully said. The Tibetan Buddhism has this understanding of the six realms from the worst being kind of the first being the most nightmarish, hellish example, you know, that you could think of in the sixth realm being like the most bliss like heaven and only in the, in the middle realm where you have the contrast of experience, does liberation become possible? And so it's duality. Yeah. And so I feel like that's truly why we're here. And when you see it from that perspective, then it becomes a, a game that you're realize that you realize you're in and not just uh, a puzzle piece in someone else's. When you go to Egypt and lay in the sarcophagus, and experience it. And I'm bummed because my next trip to Egypt is next month, but it's going to be my last one for a little while because I've kind of got the message that it's time for me to go to some of the other sites again, you know, um, play my flute in all the different places. Yeah. And, and so we're going to go to Angkor Wat. We're going to go to Gobekli Tepe. We're going to go to... Amazing. Uh, we're going to Jerusalem and, and Petra um, and Holy Land in general, and we're going to go to the England. We're going to all the chakra centers around the planet that are all on, you know, these ley lines and Nazca lines, of course. And um, I'm very excited for this. I'm still going to go back to Egypt, I'm sure, but it probably won't be for a few years. But when you go there, there's something very special about it. I've spent 11 nights in the Great Pyramid now. My last trip, they gave me a key to the pyramid. So it's like the concierge key for the pyramid. It's pretty <laughs> funny, you know, like the frequent fire program or something. <laughs> I've spent more nights there and, and rented the pyramid more than anyone else. Um, and it opens up something in you. It changes you. You become less judgmental, more accepting. And you realize that the journey of life you've been on has been preset and chosen by you 
for the most amazing realizations. And maybe that is God pleasuring himself. But even the bad things that happen to you, you start to realize the wisdom in the experience and the beauty in it. And you start to remember, and then the universe opens up around you. Your experience with time changes. Your experience with day-to-day life changes. Um, And you start noticing that things like the news article I just read this morning, that the core of the earth is now strangely spinning in the opposite direction. And you start noticing, of course, the news stories that you're seeing where it seems like we're on the verge of some sort of revolution or... Um, it just seems so dystopian or that the president or the former president, whichever side you want to take on this, is going to go down because of some corruption scandal and that it's all dirty. It's funny. I spoke at the United Nations um, in September. And I went to speak at Walter Russell's university, which was an important homecoming for me also uh, at the science, University of Science and Philosophy. I slept in his room. It was like an amazing experience. I gave a three-hour lecture there. And then after that, I went to the United Nations. A lot of people were like, you're speaking at the United Nations? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I got invited to speak at the United Nations, so I'll speak at the United Nations, (laughs) okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say what I'm going to speak on, right? They just want me to speak on something, and I'm going to speak on something. The first thing I did, I got up and said, governments are corrupt. And it's time for the systems to change. <laughs> Did I say that? Whoops. It's high time. And the funny part is, is nobody disagreed with me. It was like, yeah, we know type of thing. It right. was like, okay, I don't know if I should be more alarmed, if I should be happy, <laughs> or what I should be. Uh, I got invited uh, twice to go to speak at uh, in Davos, and I was like, oh, that's not happening. Mm. And um, because I just know that, Even if I went up there and said, okay, yeah, you guys all like trying to take over the world, the elites and all this kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I want nothing of it. And oh, by the way, (laughs) you know what I mean? People would freak out, Uh like literally freak out. Um, And already I get this stuff. People will write. It's like, watch out, Robert. Some guy will comment. He went to the United Nations. I'm like, yeah, to tell them it's all corrupt. And... um, you know, and he's connected to the WF. I'm like, no, I've never spoken to the WF, and I probably never will speak to the WF. I've been invited several times. But the truth is, is that in a non-dualistic world and experience, we need to be able to recognize that the light needs the darkness as much as a diamond needs the black velvet behind it. Mm. When you're showcasing a diamond... And that's the stage we're going into, diamond consciousness. That's beautiful. And it's what is achieved through the heart. The ring cell stone is the stone that forms in the heart like a diamond. It's compressed from all of the strife and struggle and challenge that you lived through and experienced and achieved a higher level of purity. It's not made of diamond, but it's made from the carbon of our bodies, and it forms into a form of you know, silicone dioxide, which is a type of quartz, which turns out to be an amber stone. And the brain has something similar, but it's a tiger's eye. And the solar plexus also has something similar, but it's a cat's eye. This is the trinity. This is the true trinity. And as we now go into the next stage of merging this dodecahedron with the icosahedron, which is water, and the proper representation of water, which is a dihedral angle representation of 108 degrees, that is the inner lumen of the water that then lights up our DNA. When we know that the dodecahedron has a dual solid, that's the icosahedron, it already has 12 strands. Because if you rotate that structure, it already will leave a wake of 12 positions within one geometric form, which is like a strand of DNA. That is what's happening right now. The living water is the next stage. And the illumination of it, the recognition of it is tantamount to our experience of it. The moment we start to understand and believe, this is an experiential reality that is rendered real time for us based on our perceptions. Not only the perceptions we make consciously, but those subconscious programmed perceptions as well. When you start to merge with your shadow consciousness, then you can start to integrate, become friends with it, and then start to live in Leela and play. 
And that's where the next stage of humanity will be. It's not going to be simple because there's a lot of structures and strictures in society that need to dissolve as part of that transcendence. And that's what I have decided to dedicate my, the rest of my life to, which is to help to build the new, not focus on tearing down the old, maybe bring awareness to that, but to help build the new, just like Buckminster Fuller said, don't try to destroy the new. You'll never create change successfully by taking on an effort to destroy the old. Just build the new. Yeah. And, and I think that's where the future is going, and I'm super excited to be here at this point in time, and it's my destiny to be here just as it is yours and just as it is all of the viewers' destiny. It's time to follow our hearts. And with that comes the total authenticity so that we can learn how to love and be loved. It's like the last scene in Moulin Rouge. I love that. Where, you know, you've got Ewan McGregor and um, they're singing that song, Come What May. And right before they sing that song, you know, the John Louis Gazzano, I can't remember pronounce his name, the one actor that's the Latin American guy. And he was playing kind of a midget character in the show. And, and he's hanging off a rope, and he says, the purpose of life is just to learn to love and to be loved in return. That's all it is. Mm. So we get complex thinking, oh, it's about saving the whales. It's about saving deforestation, not even realizing every time we judge that that's what it is, it only creates more of it. The ultimate mind screw. Think about that. Yeah. The people that have been judging those things didn't even realize that they're inadvertently creating that imagery over and over and over again in their consciousness because of their very judgment of it. It's not separate from you. I am that I am. We all are. I think that's just the most prosperous energy to come forth with because... Uh, there is a conspirior conspiratorial type that, you know, point the finger at the reptilian overlords that are the reason why the downfall of humanity is happening. And it's like you become what you judge, like we just spoke to so many times. Um, this whole podcast has been so nutrient dense. So first of all, just thank you so much. Thank and you. just seeing like the water behind your eyes when you were sharing about the sarcophagus and like your that that to me represents and shows like a true transformation has happened within you and that you've really been touched by life. And I think that you are, I know that you're here to, to be a pioneer in a deep way on this planet. So I see you and man, we got to run this back. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. And you took me places today that I haven't gone and talked about much before at all. And I, I appreciate that. So thank you for all your preparation. And I, I could tell that you did. So, mm. and for watching Codex too, so that you knew about it and what it is. But yeah. I hope that, I, I, I truly hope that people will get this simple message. You know, there's two great commandments, and I think the Bible gets this one right. And it's love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength, and recognize you are that. You're just part of it. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the other part of it, because I could say that's actually just the first commandment. The second part would be judge not lest ye be judged with the same judgment which you cast on others. That is the experience we're living. That is the perfect description of what the third dimensional experience of earth is. Once we can learn to transcend that, then Nelly bar the door because then all bets are off. You could have the life that you always dreamt of where you're in consistent movement with that river of wisdom that is the universe and you can trust it and surrender to it and allow it to take you where it will go where it goes nobody knows but it will be the highest and best purpose for you hmm. so beautiful couple quick last rapid fire questions before we do mm -hmm. that where can people find you robert edward grant.com uh yes robert edward grant.com and and there's a nice search function on there too so you could pretty much go into a search thing on the site and find pretty much anything uh you know just by keyword searches and and also i'm on instagram i'm on uh facebook so i have other pages also that you guys might not know that are related to me but light is consciousness 
is one of the pages, which is on Instagram. Uh, there's also a Facebook presence. Uh, there's several pages that are English, like Sacred Geometry. Geometria Sagrada is, is one of our pages as well. And, um, and so we, we have uh, most of the content that is, you know, it's sort of shared between all those three pages. All my content ends up on those, those three pages, and it's on pretty much all the platforms, including TikTok and everything. So you can find us on many different platforms. I think in total we've got about 3 million or so uh, followers on, on these different pages. And it's been fun. You know, it's been, I only started sharing my uh, geometric work and such um, and my journey. So I'd start doing notebooks and I, I presented it. When I did the presentation in Egypt, I was just taking pictures. I didn't have a PowerPoint per se. I took pictures of my notebook pages and I put that into a PowerPoint. And everyone was like, whoa, <laughs> this is like, this is like artwork. And, and I was like, well, well, it was just sort of my notes. And, and they're like, can we, you know, can you publish this? And so I have, I published those in a book series called the mirror of consciousness. And I'm through three volumes now. Um, and then I turned all of that work into more academic books in Philomath and polymath. And I have another book coming out soon, uh, which is about data and that's called neuro mind. M-I-N-E-D, the concept of neuromining people, mm. which is what's happening in the world right now. And it is presenting a huge threat to our individuality. So we're now at this stage where we have to maintain a balance of understanding our one aspect, our oneness aspect, but still valuing the individual and individual sovereignty. Yeah. That's this... So there's going to be a big thrust towards things like communistic models and everything, which are like, no, it's not about being equal. It's about, you know, um, achieving equality through equity, right? The, these kind of concepts are becoming more and more prevalent in society, right? And actually, that kind of runs counter to understanding the value of the individual. I love the diversity we have, right? Think about it. It's like, like I said, a world without curves is like a pretty sad world altogether, right? I love the curve. I love the irrationality of the line that then becomes this beautiful thing. A basic line looks way better when it's curvy. So <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. And the same is true when we start to extend that to all the diversity that we have on the planet, whether it's flora or fauna or human diversity and the way of different ways of looking at things this is what's going to get valued in society. Creativity, we're now moving into a creator economy, not a middleman economy. We've been a middleman economy, which is all based on uh, agency, on third-party representation, and lack or obfuscation of information, right? inefficient markets. I think that period of time is coming to its ignominious end, and I, I believe that the next stage of life is going to all be about the creator economy of individual sovereignty. So maybe that has implications on what kinds of government structures we need. Do we really need this much? I don't think so. I think that we have a ton of redundancy and the agency in our government systems right now are definitely the cause. It's an endemic aspect of the corruption which is now being exposed in it all. So I think we're going to be in for some major change. I'm up for it. <laughs> and I, I hope to be able to play a role as a catalyst in that in my last, you know, three or four decades of life. Hmm. You're already a big catalyst in so many ways. So again, thank you so much. Last few little questions that will be shorter. Um, if you could teleport to any moment in history and witness something, where would you go and why and when? Well... One of the things that happens as you do a lot of this geometric work, and this is a secret that I think I'd love to let people know, is that the more perspectives you can see, the more you're able to see through time. So you can remember your past lives as if they are now, because they are now. There's nothing past. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have another life. I've never seen anything of my lives in the future. I think this one and this place and this plane and this existence is, is done for me. I'm pretty sure of that. But I have been able to jump into different timelines of my lifetimes and experience those moments 
and all of us can do it. Mm -hmm. That might sound really whacked out for people, but you can. It requires you to remember to a certain extent those identities and those individual imprints. Yeah. Um, and then you can tap into it not only through meditation, but through waking experience. It's real. Um, so I have jumped through a lot of different timelines. Yeah. I was freaked out last year. I got to tell you, somebody posted this picture from 1895. There was a picture of a man who had a moon-shaped hair, mm -hmm. right? 1895 it was done by Noggle. He's like a famous photographer. It was like a black and white. And it had moon-shaped hair around his face. And his face was absolutely my face. Like, even to the point where I was like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. How could this even be possible? Right? So there's a lot more, like I said, the truth is so much stranger than we can conceive of fiction could yeah. be. Um, where would I jump in time, though, to now? I would probably say... Because it would be relevant to what's going, what's happening right now, I would say probably around the time of what I would call the 18th century Enlightenment, which was, you know, sort of like John Locke, period, uh, Benjamin Franklin, um, this whole idea of what they called the American experiment. I would really like to go back and ask some questions on what they were experiencing right prior to the, you know, what we, what we refer to as the American Revolution. You know, there's a great story that is told by um, John Adams, uh, but also by uh, Benjamin Franklin, where they walk out of the Continental Congress and this woman says, what happened, what happened? And Benjamin Franklin says, well, we have a republic if we can keep it. Right? Because... If you go back in time, Plato wrote a book called The Republic, and The Republic was about all the different forms of government and the cycles of government that we go through, and that, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that you go through this cyclicality, which includes an anarchy and a mob rule, right, and oligarchies, right, and monarchies, and, and how they just literally go through this cycle over and over and over again, and we think that it's totally unique and different, it's never unique or different. It's just part of a cycle that's all outlined in the Republic. And what he said was, we have a Republic if you can keep it. If you know the backdrop of the story, the backdrop of the story, which really was setting up a representative democracy, right? But the backdrop of the story was that the states of the 13 colonies, the Continental Congress, they did not all agree, right? So they thought, hey, we're going to go ahead and write a letter to King George III of England, and we're going to say, we don't like this taxation without representation, and clearly Mother England is going to come to our aid, and maybe the king's not even aware of these sort of like oppressive rules they're placing on our society here without representation. And so we're just going to make him aware of it. So they sent him a letter saying, we don't want to pay taxes on this stuff, and you know, this is back to the Boston Tea Party type stuff. And so they're all meeting in Congress trying to figure out how they're going to set up their government and everything and do their breakaway thing. And they were called the Continental Congress that had no legal authority whatsoever. And the king actually united them. The king of England sent back a proclamation. It wasn't a proclamation in the form of a letter to them. It was a proclamation to everybody saying, these people have written me this letter and they're traitors and we're going to hang and kill all of them. So Benjamin Franklin got up and said, wow, what we ourselves could not do to unite ourselves, the English king just did for us. For now, either we hang together or we shall surely hang separately. I'd be interested to know the thinking. Now, we can always look back, and, and Bill Maher did a nice job of this. He's like, oh, I don't like this about how we look back on the past with the lens of that we have today. You know, he's like, yes, uh, Christopher Columbus was atrocious, but the people of 1492 were largely atrocious, <laughs> right? So it's like we, we can't take our lens of how we look at the world and apply it to all the history. Yeah, there were things that happened back then that were more in the realm of acceptable 
right, that are today reprehensible. Yeah. But we can't judge the history with that lens of today, right? And and so it's pretty funny because I think we all get caught in that. But I do believe that the the founding fathers um, did have largely good intention. The fact that you know some of them were slave owners, et cetera, is certainly something that we can look at today and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's crazy. But to then have that be something that would be used to to relegate what they accomplished to being something that was absolutely of the devil or Luciferian, I think is a stretch. I think it's a total stretch. I think they had good intention. I think they knew that it wasn't going to last for more than a couple hundred years. I think we're at the end of that. I think that they tried to put in place mechanisms in, in wisdom John Adams was certainly someone who had a great deal of wisdom, and so was Benjamin Franklin, another polymath, who you know discovered electricity, as we all know the story, you know where he gets electrocuted, right, with the kite and everything. But he was a great inventor as well. I think these people had generally good intention, and I think they felt that they had providence at their backs because they felt like that the new Jerusalem and the new existence of this new five-dimensional experience was only going to come about as a result of them taking the effort. Of course, we now know it was all predetermined, but taking the effort to do what they did and risk their lives to do it. I would like to sit and caucus with Benjamin Franklin, with John Adams, with Thomas Jefferson, with George Washington. And I'm sure what I've learned through life when I was 20 years old, I used to think my parents were stupid. And then when I turned 21, every year for the next seven years, my parents' IQ increased about 20 <laughs> points. Funny. Everything was black and white when I was 20 years old. Yeah. And as I got to 30, I started realizing, well, things are still mainly black and white, but maybe there's a few gray things. And yeah, you have to put your heart into certain things and it can't all just be black and white. It's not all just numbers. And by the time I got to 40, I was like, gosh, everything's pretty gray. And then at 50, I was like, uh, nothing's really black and white anymore. That's wisdom. Yeah. Amazing. Beautiful answer. Um, because we've been going for three hours, which is absolutely incredible, we'll just do two more. They'll be quick mm -hmm. and, and we'll have to run it back because this is so... I could talk to you for literally a week straight and mm -hmm. not get tired. Um, what do you think is the most valuable physical object on planet Earth? If you had to pick one that you know of. You. Who you are. Your differentiation, your uniqueness. Um, and that, unfortunately, is now under assault. You know, I have like how many fakes of me on, mm -hmm. on you know, Telegram? It's, it drives me nuts. It drives me absolutely batty. So there yeah. needs to be something to fix that and safeguard your individuality. And that's one of the things that I've dedicated my work effort to do. And that's what Crown Sterling does. Uh, it's all about data sovereignty and you owning your own data. And we've invented, um, you know, the first usage of the same encryption that's used on nuclear codes yeah. for blockchain. I believe blockchain is going to play a huge role in overcoming the agency problem of representative democracy. I really do. And I think it's going to overcome a big problem that is already emerging, which is um, imposterhood, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's going to only get worse and worse, unfortunately. It's going to be part of, it's the, it's the darkness associated with the light that's changing in the world right now. But I think you and your individuality is the most valuable thing in the world. And that's why data today and the data on you is the most valuable asset in the world. Data surpassed oil in 2018 as the world's most valuable asset yeah. class. So how do you protect that data becomes very, very important so they can withstand something called Byzantine level fault tolerance. And that's the story of when the Byzantines basically set up, they had to set up their castles so that if they got attacked on like four angles, right, of attack, then they could still withstand, or if they got attacked on multiple angles of attack, so that there was not single point of failure risk. And I think that's what's happening with individuality right now. We have single point of failure risk that needs to be decentralized. And I think that's where this is going technologically. So I think it's you that's the most viable thing in the world.
All right. Not the direction I was expecting you to go, but I love that answer. <laughs> um, if you could go back in time and read any living beings journal or diary, who would you, who would you choose? Oh, definitely. Um, Leonardo's. Yeah. Figured without a doubt. I mean, I've read a lot of his and I've read, you know, obviously the biography on his life by, uh, Walter Isaacson, which is very good. And, calls out the fact that no one knows where Da Vinci was for three years mm. um, and talks about how Da Vinci worked to square the circle for 10 years. 10 years. Mm. It's a long time. Yeah. And yet he didn't even come close to getting it right because it didn't match the perimeter or the <laughs> circumference, not even close. And, and in fact, it's like as wrong as it could possibly be <laughs> because he was doing something different. He was yeah. showing the relationship between Euler and Pi. And that actually became the construction box to solve the problems for both perimeter squaring and circumference and uh, and area value squaring. So I would love to read the detailed account of what Leonardo encountered in the three years he was in Egypt. Amazing. That would be amazing. Yeah. Because I think in that is hidden all the information that we will need and will eventually have access to for the enlightenment. Incredible. My sponge is full. This podcast has been a wealth of wisdom, knowledge, information, and man, I'm just, I'm so happy to be connected with you. And like, thank you so much for shining your light in the world in the way that you are. And um, I'm excited to continue to weave and have you back on the show for years to come. And um, just appreciate you deeply for who you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And for everybody that's been tuning in to this incredible episode of the Know Thyself podcast, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and check out um, the clips that we share on social media and are on, on our separate social media um, YouTube clips channel, all linked down in the description. Please let us know in the comment section below if there's something that resonated or was transformative for you. We'd love to hear that. And uh, until next time, be well. Be well.